chill wind cuts across the night sky as we start this episode of That's Canon, the podcast talking about the Canon film series and other similar movies. I'm Phil. And I'm Greg. Greg. I'm a vampire. Very spooky episode. Doing a little something different today. We're not we're not reviewing an old crappy movie. We're reviewing a new movie. <laughs> I okay. You, you had me going there for a second. I was wondering if you were gonna say a new crappy movie because uh, well, maybe who knows? <laughs> we, we can talk about it. Today's episode revolves around Halloween Kills, the new 2021 American slasher film directed by David Dor- Gor- da- David Gordon Green. David Gordon Green. Michael Gordon uh, Lovett, <laughs> Joseph Gordon Lovett, <laughs> and written by him, and also Danny McBride, the the comedian who who did write the 2018 Halloween film. So I won't right. I will he's say a... every time I see his name, I always get like suspect, but he's actually really good. Yeah, it, so. I, I remember when Halloween 2018 came out. When you see his name attached to it, you're like you kind of raise an eyebrow. But <laughs> I think, apparently, I think... he's a big Halloween fan, so. <laughs> I would love to have seen Danny McBride as Michael Myers. <laughs> <laughs> you can see that like, you can see his like curly mullet hanging out the back of the mask. Yeah. He's like, what are you going to do, asshole? I'll fuck you up. Give me one second. <laughs> <laughs> He's struggling to get the mask on. <laughs> <laughs> so Halloween as let's just talk about Halloween as a saga. Yeah. First off, so Halloween, I think we're up to this is like the 11th film uh yeah yeah include so it's all the like the original series from the 70s and 80s then you get the couple of like 90s 2000s ones like h2o and resurrection right yep and then there's the rob zombie verse and then the this new 2018 trilogy right that's like that's the kind of yeah categories and then like if you want to if you want to like excise halloween 3 as its own thing because it doesn't right. have michael myers in it but it's still a really awesome film um and hot take i like the first rob zombie halloween film the second one is garbo hot garbage i i i'm not as well versed in the ones that came after halloween uh five um i i, I don't think i've seen any of the the, the 90s 2000s ones with jimmy lee curtis and i haven't seen the rob zombie ones so I can't weigh in on those. I, you know what? I can, though, because I recently rewatched pretty much all of these films. <laughs> um, ha- so Halloween H2O is is pretty good. It's directed by Steve Miner, who actually directed Friday the 13th Part 2 and 3 and Lake Placid. Oh, oh so OK. He's got a couple couple great ones under his belt. Yeah, he's got some um, some slasher cred. H2O is good. It is like. It is like a three and a half <laughs> film, right? Uh, I think the, the biggest issues that it has is Josh Hartnett. He, he looks like an asshole. Like his haircut is like <laughs> um, choppy. He looks like an asshole. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and Michael Myers masks. He has like, he goes through like four different masks in this film. Not that they're different in that it's the tr- not the traditional one. But they have four different versions of the traditional Halloween mask. Oh. Like, I guess when they were making it, they didn't like the look, so they changed it. And at points, there's CGI masks involved what? and stuff. Like, in yeah. like it changes midway through the movie. Like, does it does it get destroyed on screen? He has to replace it, or is it just kind nope. of changed for no explanation? It just kind of changes. Ugh. It's it's really it's <laughs> it's one of the worst masks. I think the worst one is part five Ye- i'm trying it, to i they're all kind that of one looks together. very very sharp it looks very um well you know what let me pull up halloween michael myers masks and i'll I... send you okay also check discord because here's the cgi mask <laughs> oh god that's bad right that's really bad it looks like a ps1 game it does where there's like those like baked in shadows on the texture (laughs) and then here's a list of all of them so obviously like part one and two pretty on point obviously number one is perfect number two you can see like there's a little bit of changes um and then we jumped to halloween four (laughs) 
Which is, and he he has like a, a mafioso slip, slicked back hairdo yeah, in and, that. <laughs> yeah, he he does kind of he looks like a like a salesman or something. And it's, yeah, it's it's a lot flatter. There's not as much shadow. I mean, that's maybe how it's lit, but it looks droopier almost. Like 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 the first mask got left in the sun too long and it started to melt a little bit. Like yeah, the nose like, looks flat. He lost a lot of weight and the skin hasn't retracted yet. <laughs> and he had a really bad nose job because he just yeah. looks like a pig. Uh, number five, it looks very sharp. It like It's like they leaned up the face in all the wrong places. Number five looks like Lance Henriksen. It, you know what? It does. <laughs> Halloween five, Lance Henriksen's revenge. Um, <laughs> number six looks good. It's kind of moody. And, you know... It kind of looks more like the more the traditional Halloween films, but part six is a piece of shit film. I don't think I've even seen part six, honestly. That it has Paul Rudd in it. He plays is that, that Tommy. Paul R- oh, okay. One of the yeah. So yeah, speaking of Tommy, he you know, one of one of the many characters who does come back in Halloween kills. Yeah. And I'm so I'm I'm sad that they didn't get Paul Rudd. I would love to have seen Paul Rudd in Halloween Kills. Yeah, he's aged <laughs> up enough, I guess. So why not? Uh, H2O. We've already talked about that one. That's just one of the mini masks inside of it. Halloween 8, which is Halloween Resurrections, which is dog shit. But he does look pretty good in it. The issue with that film, though, is they do a lot of POV shots from like these webcams. So the resolution and the quality is uh. shit. So, uh, yeah, that's another one I haven't seen. Did they try to do like a found footage thing in that one? Is that what you're thinking? Uh, For Halloween Resurrections, the idea was that they're going to do a live simulcast inside the Myers house of a bunch of teenagers going inside of there trying to figure out the mystery of Michael Myers. And Buster Rhymes is (laughs) in it. And he actually he's like running the show and he's like set up fake traps and stuff like that. At one point, Buster Rhymes dresses up as Michael Myers, runs into Michael Myers, who's dressed up as Michael Myers. And he's like, (laughs) he's like, hey, motherfucker, I'm the one who's dressed up as Michael Myers tonight. Like, you need to get the fuck out of here. (laughs) And then, of course, he probably gets killed immediately. uh, Buster, actually, he gets the shit kicked out of him, but he does survive the entire film. Um, I don't know why I remember this, but I remember seeing an interview with Buster Rhymes about this movie when it was coming out. And I, I, I believe it was John Stewart, which is even weirder. Oh, uh, John Stewart was doing the interview and he asked Buster, he's like, so do you die? And he was like, I filmed like three different endings and two of them I die. And he's like, I don't know which ones they're using. So I have no <laughs> idea. <laughs> that's kind of i, I kind of like that idea so that the, like a way to keep actors from spoiling the ending of movies that they're in yeah keep probably, them on their toes probably more important now than have a twitter's a thing it's like <laughs> I, I remember reading like like tom holland kind of like spoils all the spider-man stuff inadvertently maybe that's what they should be doing they yeah just, like, exactly. they, they film two spider-man movies and they don't tell them how to, <laughs> they're cutting it together that'd be pretty good uh and then the rob zombie in halloween 2018 halloween kills it it seems like we were in the modern era so they probably use like reference files and computers in order to make this mask right yeah. it's definitely so it, much more damaged on point yeah it looks like the more traditional version of it though <laughs> you said you haven't seen the rob zombie i haven't uh, no, either of them there is one point where little Michael Myers puts on that mask. Like he finds that mask as a kid and he puts it on and he looks insane because it's this giant adult mask that a child (laughs) is wearing (laughs) on a little baby body. (laughs) Yeah. It looks like Uh, a me, like a me character. Yeah. Oh, that's exactly, that's a perfect way of putting it. He looks like a me character. (laughs) Do, 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 do. It's so weird. Um, the the whole movie that one it's been a while since i've seen it but they they take a lot of time showing michael myers as a kid and i think that's almost half the film and then once you get to michael myers inside the hospital he's like kind of an adult 
Mm-hmm. And uh, he's played by Tyler Maine, who is a WWE wrestler. So he looks ginormous. Uh, like both like just he's tall and I'm assuming just like shredded. So he looks and like shredded. a bodybuilder. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, when they show the inside of his cell inside of Smith's Grove Sanitarium, he has masks. He just has tons of masks that he's made. And Sam Loomis, who's played <laughs> by shit i forgot his name he's in uh star trek generations uh McDowell? william shatner <laughs> yeah william shatner <laughs> he was wearing a mask of himself uh he's uh oh malcolm mcdowell the, yeah malcolm mcdowell who plays sam loomis in it is essentially like michael myers has a mask for everything even taking a poop so like he like <laughs> puts on different masks and stuff that like that is so stupid <laughs> Isn't that such like a weird thing to do? There's also this this really weird incestuous overtone in the film where Michael Myers, uh, he like his mom in the film is a stripper because it's a Rob Zombie film. Everyone's like dirty and disgusting. Yeah, everyone's like, yeah, kind of Um, (laughs) not to say like if you're a stripper, you're dirty and disgusting. But in the Rob Zombie verse, in the Rob Zombie movie, yeah, no matter what your profession is, you look like you're on pretty tough bring it pretty rough times yeah yeah you're doing double meth Uh, um (laughs) like extra meth his the kid is just like very obsessed with his mom and it there's just this incest overtone with the entire film um and then like the last 30 minutes is the remake of pretty much the first film of halloween like the last that's the last 30 minutes of it oh do they just like not know what to do? So it's like, uh, I guess he's got to do Michael Myers stuff now. So I think let's so. let him loose in Haddonfield. It seems like it. It seems like they got to the end and Rob Zombie's like, OK, so we got him to the hospital and the movie's like an hour and a half already. We need him to do something more. So let's tack on the remake of Halloween to this one. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess at this point, how much time has passed since the original movie, like 30 years? I mean, I guess they're thinking they're trying to bring it to a new audience. So they could probably they probably thought they could get away with that without feeling like it's a copycat necessarily. But but there have been so many of the ho- other Halloween movies at that point. You'd think that everyone, all the entire audience is somewhat familiar. Yeah, 100 percent. But I will say this. I think Halloween Kills suffers from some of this as well. Uh, the like who is Michael Myers and where does he come from but we'll get into that in a second we're not done with Rob Zombie yet he, so he then he makes <laughs> Halloween 2 and that movie's a giant piece of shit because the first 30 minutes of it's a fucking dream Greg are you kidding me I'm not that's like a full third of the movie I exactly assume. yeah I hate that. It's we talking about Star Trek. Those were always like my least favorite Star Trek episodes too. Or like the it, it, in Star Trek, it was they were always like the time travel ones where like nothing actually really mattered because they just yeah. undid everything and they they basically end this episode where they began. It, it's I, I, it's cool, but it, it, it's narratively annoying. Exactly a hundred percent. Um, and then you do what any great you know film producer does you you sit on your property for years and by the way i just sent you a photo of a kid in the mask <laughs> is is that the is that the me is that the, is it the michael myers me yeah. character it's <laughs> <That's> absurd <laughs> um that is that is pretty fun everyone everyone should google that uh michael myers kid rob zombie it looks hilarious <laughs> you, you sit on your property for probably like a good i want to say it was like another 10 years yeah. halloween halloween 2 came out in 2009 and then the next one halloween mm. came out in 2018 so nine years you wait nine years and then you start doing the legacy sequel which i guess we can blame people like sylvester stallone for bringing back the the rocky balboa character and it being popular um, if you had anyone to blame, I, I'm pretty sure it's him. Yeah, right? this is the the era of like the soft reboot, right? Where it's kind of a remake, but also kind of a sequel, and it kind of blurs the lines. I think, I mean, Star Trek or Star Wars: Force Awakens was basically a soft reboot in a lot of ways. Yep. So, Blade Runner, uh, all the Rocky films, all the Rambo films, uh, just a lot of these. Like, let's put the band back together, see if there's any more fucking lightning in this bottle. 
and then you know you get ghostbusters afterlife um <laughs> please be good please be good please be good. i know <laughs> so i'm saying so they got david gordon green to do these movies which like i gotta say when i look back at his filmography it's impressive only because he did one of my favorite comedies the pineapple express yeah what a weird i mean i I feel like that's one of those things that you you would never think to do, but it's probably in retrospect, a genius move. Like you get someone who's not, who's like really a genre fan, but a lot of their previous work is all over the place. Genre wise. Yeah. You get never, someone, yeah. never would have guessed that mm-hmm. this guy would have been. And he's also going to do the exorcist, the new exorcist films. Right. Yeah. Which is another big surprise. I mean, I guess <sighs> It's 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 it bodes well, but at the same time, it's kind of like groany because it's just like this guy, this poor guy is getting, you know, typecast as the the successful horror movie franchise rebooter. Yep. So because cool. he is bringing back Ellen Burstein. Uh, so they already they already like dug up her coffin and brought her back out, even though she's not dead. <laughs> <laughs> this exactly. is where I live. So I mean, so he does Halloween 2018, which I think we're both on the same page. Halloween 2018 was an awesome movie. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I feel like I would maybe appreciate it more if I had seen some of these really terrible Halloween sequels that we, we, were, we were just talking about. But even even when not seeing those, I, I can I can appreciate it for being like a quality reboot amongst many shitty reboots. Yes, that's for sure. Um, I think all the Halloween 2018 has got a lot going for it. They bring back Jamie Lee Curtis, who is invested and in renewed in the franchise, uh, which is refreshing to see. Uh, uh, not that I, she wasn't for H2O, but when she did Halloween Resurrection, she was definitely very vocal of like, this movie's a piece of shit, even when it was coming out. And just took so, the paycheck, I'm assuming. Yeah, exactly. Um, and this one has... You know, it, John Carpenter didn't help write it, but you could definitely feel like he was probably consulted. And he also did the soundtrack for it, too. Which I feel like is a bigger part of why Halloween 2018 is is feels as good as it is, because the, there's like a, there's that element of the Carpenter like synthesizer soundtrack that just it adds that kind of. I don't know what the right it's it's like a like a quality varnish to the whole thing that just kind of ties everything together and makes it feel like a Halloween movie that other the other ones probably lacked. Exactly. Uh, I was hyped for this film. So hyped. I got I bought a t-shirt before it came out from Fright Rags. I was watching the preview probably <laughs> like every week. I was oh, pumped. And I'm so uh, happy that you 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 went through all of that prep and kind of like self-hype and I'm so happy for you that it wasn't a pile of shit because <laughs> you would have been so disappointed. You were just setting yourself up for catastrophic failure there. Potentially. Uh, I went, I saw Halloween when my wife and kid saw, there was like another kid friendly horror movie that came out around the same time. So kid they saw that family. in one. Yeah. I forgot what it was. Maybe like Adam's family or something. Oh, you're like, like, like CGI. Wasn't there like hotel, like Transylvania, like that vampire. Yeah. One? It could have been something like that too. I saw this while they saw that. Okay. And yeah, it was awesome. I could tell like <laughs> right from the get go, what I was seeing was going to be amazing. I mean, the rotten tomato score was like an 80%. The, the film did gangbusters, $255 million especially oh, for wow. a slasher horror film. And and I'm sure the budget, I mean, like every modern horror movie is, is usually like that. Like that's why they're still profitable. That's why they're still making them is because they're so easy, like cheap to produce. And even if exactly. they do modern, like they don't do billion dollar Avengers Endgame business, they still like make a profit. Because this was, and it's also a Blumhouse film. And we know Blumhouse is notorious for like being cheap. And it was only a $10 million film. Oh, awesome. So yeah, $10 million, 255 back. And then obviously, I think it was like, it was just like a couple months later. Instagram hit. Uh, Jamie Lee Curtis posted, essentially, you guys fucking loved Halloween. Well, guess what? In 2021, Halloween kills. Or in 2020, Halloween kills. <laughs> yeah. 2021, Halloween ends. Back to back, filming this motherfucker. And it's going to be great. And then the pandemic hit. 
I don't know if everyone's aware of this, but at one point in the world, <laughs> there's this thing called COVID-19 and it <laughs> fucked shit up. And it pushed all of the movies that you wanted to see out forever. Um, and then we get to this year and Halloween Kills is finally coming out and it's doing a, a dual release theaters and Peacock. Right. And that's where our story kicks in. But from two different perspectives, you saw it in a theater. I did. I saw it in Peacock. Yep. Yeah. Becky and I, we went to the Alamo Draft House. Love that theater. We figure, okay, you know, we've been back for a couple things. We actually saw the thing there um, last week also on a Wednesday. We, we, we were kind of slowly creeping back into our theater going habit, but um, I, which I applaud you. I have yet to go back. And even, even Jackie is like, when she's like, when the fuck are you going back to the movies? <laughs> well, well, we'll, we'll get into that as part of this, but I'll, I'll, I'll tip my hand a little and say that it, it while for the most part, our theater going experience has been positive since, you know, kind of some of the COVID restrictions have been eased it back on. This one was not so good. I, I think I almost think that we 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 enjoyed the movie in despite the theater experience. Interesting. So. What what happened? What happened in the movie theater? Like, so, I, was I, there just some like was there some blob sitting next to you? Like when I saw <laughs> fucking Deadpool and he was just pounding nom, double nom, fist nom, and popcorn, nom. <laughs> breathing loud and yeah, straining to to get through that burger he ordered. So yeah, I mean it was deep. Phil, you you remember when you and I went to go see Avengers Endgame? Speaking of that movie, and yes. the entire theater was like there there's like two there's like the spectrum of a of of theater like out loud reactions right and and there's the appropriate reaction which is like laughter in a comedy when jokes happen or like gasps and scare like when a scary thing happens and then it it becomes more and more inappropriate when you're like you know talking and texting them in the movie or you're like talking and reacting to things before they happen that you think you know is going to happen or you're saying things like oh don't go in there blah 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 like, right, there's like a spectrum where it becomes and where it goes from like, acceptable to unacceptable. And we were hard on the unacceptable side. Really? In this in this theater experience. Yeah. Which is surprising for Alamo. I mean, normally you think of that as like, oh, you know, they they will crack down on that. But they really didn't here. And I kind of it's kind of depressing that they didn't because it was it was very much like when we saw Avengers Endgame and people were like calling out things to the screen like that they thought were that sometimes they were right. Sometimes they weren't, but like they were calling out things like, Oh, I can't like go do that. Don't go in there. Do this. Don't do that. It, it just like took the wind out of the sails a little bit for us, which is mm. really unfortunate. And they were doing uh. that thing where like, they would like laugh at things that weren't meant to be funny. Like even like some of the dark humor that you get in some of these horror movies to like, kind of like break the tension a little bit. They laughed at that, but they were laughing at other things like, like some of the gore shots and stuff. I, I don't know. It, it's it's hard to explain, but it definitely was not the fun type of communal movie experience that you would expect in a theater. Brutal. Yeah, that is that's disappointing. Um, I saw it in my house <laughs> in, in the comfort and silence of your own home. I uh, I signed up for Peacock, and then I had to get the ultimate version of Peacock. And even after I did that, it still took time to sync with the server that I bought Peacock and that I was able to use Peacock on my TV. And oh. then even then, it was still like I clicked Halloween Kills. And it was like, you need the ultimate version of Peacock. Oh, I was my like, God. Fucking kidding me. I was going to say, I can only imagine re- your reaction when you saw that when you already have like you're already forking over money for this. Yeah. And you're like, and it comes asking for more. So like I check my email and I make sure like everything is set up and everything is good. And then I like, I log back out and I log back in and I think it it just needed like that, that refresh, which I like, we're in it. I should have known, just turn it off and turn it right back on. (laughs) Turn it off and on again. Yeah. Yeah. Um, So yeah, that's kind of like, I guess that's where we, did you look at the reviews before going into the movie? No. Like, did you look at Rotten Tomatoes? Did you look at anything like we, that? We were both in agreement that we would avoid all, because we don't necessarily do this with everything, but for horror movies we do because horror movies tend to be very love them or hate them. And they, or they, or they tend to have like really high audience scores and low like critical review scores. So 
we, we didn't want to tarnish our opinion before we went in. So we avoided it. What so about you? I'm, I'm dumb. I looked at it before I started watching <laughs> because the Halloween 2018 is like 80%, right? Mm-hmm. So um, I, I am always one of those, especially knowing that this is going to be a trilogy. If your first movie in your trilogy is really good, your second one has to be better. Because your third one's going to be disappointing. It's like a bell curve, right? Like yeah. the, the third one, it's never going to wrap up. Uh, the second one was at 40% when I yeah. started to watch it. Yeah, it's and and I think this, so we, we did look afterwards and, and we saw exactly what you just said. And it, it, it was kind of jarring at first, but then you realize you, you dig into that score and it was exactly what I just said, where critics hate this movie. But yeah. the audience score was up in the mid '80s or higher. I may be different now, but uh, audience score seems to be still like seventy six percent on Metacritic, which I think is a little more harsh. It's at like a six point one, and I want to say on uh, on Rotten Tomatoes, yeah, it's still like a seventy. So it, it was interesting, and then you start the movie you start halloween kills and it picks up immediately where we left off from the first film and we meet um oh shit where the fuck are my notes okay they're there uh we find (laughs) deputy hawkins he's like on the ground he's been stabbed and cameron from the first film sees him and he freaks out and he calls an ambulance to like save him right i think this immediately fixed my biggest issue with Halloween that they killed, quote unquote, killed Deputy Hawkins. Right. I Which think that's like the... my, my he's Will Patton. Um, he's just, yeah. I guess spoilers for like the entire film. He's just the old dude that lays next to Laurie Strode the entire film. Yeah, he is. But I do like that. Yeah, I, I agree. I like that he survived. Um, it was kind of it was a it was a cool twist in 2018 when um, the, the Dr. Sartain, not not Dr. Loomis stabbed him. Yes. To, like let Michael free go free and kind of let him let the dog sniff his trail, basically. So it there was definitely um, we'll, we'll, we'll keep going. Right. So Cameron, who I definitely despised in the first film because he cheated on Laurie Strode's granddaughter and was kind of just like a a a very unlikable character. Uh, They did the unfortunate thing of making him likable in this film. Uh, All of a sudden, like he cares about the granddaughter and he wants to help find Michael Myers and save someone's life. He turns into a hero. Right. Which I was kind of hoping we meet Cameron in the beginning and he just gets dispatched <laughs> and he's the, quickly. he's the first one to die. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, I definitely credit to the actor for in the 2018. He, he definitely it's 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 one of those like thankless roles where like you've got to play the asshole. But when you play it, well, people hate the character, but you got to appreciate the acting that goes into that. So, oh, definitely. For him, yeah, definitely. Definitely. He he made me dislike him, which is great. Oh, yeah, for um, sure testament of a good actor and then we we like fade away back to the 70s and i gotta tell you like full mast i was in (laughs) this film because i think that was like one of my (laughs) that was uh that was like one of my biggest i guess mysteries right halloween Mike, the the original Halloween, John Carpenter's Halloween. It right. ends with Sam Loomis shooting Michael Myers off the balcony, and then he looks down and he's gone, and he gives that knowing glance, right? Like, yeah, I knew this was going to happen. Yep, he got and, away. And then Halloween two, they blow each other up in a hospital, and that's how they tie the ribbon on the bow. <laughs> but because Halloween two doesn't exist anymore, my my question was oh, has been like how the fuck did they capture Michael Myers right. then? Like, how do they get him back to Smith's Grove sanitarium? And how long does it take? It literally takes like 20 minutes after the film <laughs> to find 
Yes. And capture Michael Myers again. Yeah. Which, I mean, so I, we should probably explain for anyone who's not familiar, although if, if you're not familiar, you should stop listening right now and go watch these movies. But in, in this timeline, Halloween 2018 is a direct sequel to the 1978 original. So like all of the crazy sequels are totally out the window. And you're right. For- that was that was the big thing missing from 2018 was like, what's what's that? We needed like a little bit of a flashback to tie those together and let the audience know that those sequels don't exist. Exactly. And this is this is what this moment's doing. And it's kind of it's giving backstory to the character of Hawkins because mm-hmm. he's going to play a bigger role in it. So he's he's walking around with a deputy friend and essentially they're like, oh, hey, you know, there's Michael Myers. Like we, we need to go get him. He's and in the house. Then we get introduced to another character who's Lonnie. Right. That was his name, Lonnie. Lonnie. Yeah, I think you're right, Lonnie. He's the dad of Cameron, like the uh, the very unlikable boyfriend character. Now, when I first saw this film. I was like, I fucking hate that they're introducing a new character, quote unquote, new character in the past to bring into the future. Right. It's kind of like. It's kind of like, you know, if we, we were like, oh, like in Halloween, like there really was a character in the background the entire time. You just never saw him. And he's been observant of the entire events. Right. And that's what I felt. Yeah. Lonnie was like, it does. Yeah. I think I, on the surface, it does feel a little kind of like a cop out. Like, like they, they forgot to do something in the first movie that they want to like go back and retcon a little bit. But they don't. Because I'm fucking stupid. In 1978. <laughs> Halloween film, Sam Loomis goes, hey, hey, Lonnie, get your ass away from there. There are kids taunting each other to go into the house. And I'm just like, fuck. Uh It happened. It hit me like yesterday. And I was like, "Okay, wow. I will give them I'll give them a slice. I'll give them like a little more credit here. Right. Like that's pretty that's pretty smart. Pretty ingenious. Yeah. Um. We meet Lonnie. He's getting beat up by hoodlums. I don't know. Street trash. They're getting beat. He's getting beat bullies. up by the ghost of Rob Zombie's bullies. <laughs> <laughs> These three kids are from the Rob Zombie Halloween. <gasps> like they're like fucking licking his gobstoppers and like throwing them and stuff. Oh, Just yeah. Really, like, like white trash. Yeah. Like like no bully was this harsh in real life. <laughs> yeah. Kind of just kind of weird. Uh, the cops come by and they're like, hey, Michael Myers is on the loose. Uh, you need to get out of here. Go home. He's going to kill you. And then we 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 track Lonnie. He falls and then he he confronts or gets confronted by Michael Myers, who essentially is just looking at him. I don't think Michael Myers really has any. I never felt in the first ones. And of course, like these kids don't know in universe that Michael Myers would kill a kid i never felt that way i never felt that he was capable of it um i think i'll be proven wrong in this film uh because i think in in 78 he he shows up at the school and like a kid like bumps into him when he's running off the schoolyard right yeah that was tommy oh that was tommy yeah exactly so i mean yeah we've he's definitely uh amped up the aggression in, in the later sequels but yeah at least at that point in time he was not killing every kid who crossed his path exactly um eventually the cops specifically hawkins and his buddy they come up to the myers house and they're like he's inside uh they do a little detective work quote unquote detective work not really they're just like walking around the fucking house uh (laughs) and there's there's this odd point where deputy hawkins buddy is kind of looking out the window and he's you can see like he's even narrating it he's talking to himself he's like this is where he did it this is where he killed his sister and he looks down and he can see footprints <gasps> in the dust. And Michael Myers comes out of nowhere, starts attacking him. Uh, Hawkins comes up and he's like, Hey, you know, like let him go, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. He's got uh, he, the, he's got the other deputy in kind of like, like a headlock. He's using him as like a human shield. So his partner doesn't really have a clear shot at him. And do they show what happens at this point in the very beginning? Yeah, they do. They do. Yeah. They Hawkins shoots, hits the hits his buddy in the neck, kills him. And then Michael Myers just kind of like 
speed walks away. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of really weird. It doesn't, it's not dramatic. Like he doesn't jump out the window or like knock down the other cop. He just kind of slinks away while the cop like, oh shit, I just shot my other mate. You know, I just shot my deputy. Exactly. He's like, I just shot my buddy. And you can hear Sam Loomis in outside as yeah. Michael Myers comes outside. Um, it's a pretty good impression. I bought it. I definitely believed it. And then in walks into the house, Sam Loomis, he confronts Debbie Hawkins and he's like, hey, did he kill the cop? And I was like, wow, that's a that's a really good CGI job. It's actually someone who looks like him. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, we I, I was not expecting to see like a CG Sam Loomis, but it's easily one of the best you know, instances of that that I've ever seen. I'm, I'm thinking back to like the, the grand Moff Tarkin in rogue one, which looked oh. pretty good, but it felt like it, when he was talking, it looked weird. This is really good. No, this is a guy. This is a dude. This is a real dude. Wait, wait, wait. There was no CG on his face at all. It was prosthetics and makeup. Wow. Okay. Well, that explains why it looks so good then. Cause if so, he talks, that's usually when you can tell the lips don't move. Right. I guess like when they were doing the casting and stuff like that, from what I've read online, I kid you not, John Carpenter pointed at that some dude that was on set because he's the art director. And he was like, he looks like Sam Loomis. You should just use him. And they're like, OK, <laughs> and that's we, we listen to John Carpenter. <laughs> yeah. So uh, they're, you know, they're kind of yelling and screaming like, did he kill him? Blah, blah, blah. And then Halloween kills. Right. Like the title card comes up and then we get a bunch of spooky flying flaming pumpkins and it's definitely Ooh. i gotta say like the intro this this prologue set my hype meter up, up i was 11. so fucking pumped yeah i think and i think the reason for at least for me the reason i i agree with you is it was like a little bit of a, like a nostalgia injection Yes, I feel like like that's like that's why people are excited for this series anyway, is because they love the old movies and they just want more of that. It was kind of a genius move to put something that like sounds and, and looks like a 70s film right at the beginning here to like prime you for the rest of the movie. Almost awesome. Awesome idea. And then we cut it's We're back in, quote unquote, present day Halloween. It's still the night of Michael Myers attacking Laurie Strode. And we're at a bar and that's when we're introduced to we're, we're introduced to Michael Thomas Hall, Michael C. Hall. No, it's not Michael C. Hall. Michael mm -hmm. C. Hall is someone else. Anthony Michael Hall. Anthony Michael Hall. There we go. Uh, we're introduced to Anthony <laughs> Michael Hall. He's portraying Tommy Doyle. Uh, I guess they couldn't get the original actor and Paul Rudd. He's off <laughs> making <laughs> Ghostbusters. Uh, we get... Lindsay, the original Lindsay, who is uh, played by I just had her fucking name up. And that was the that was a little girl who Laurie's friend was babysitting at the same time. Right. Yes. Across the street. Yeah. Um, she's played by Kyle Richards, who is the original Lindsay. Kyle Richards is probably best known for in being a real housewife. Yes, right? I know. She's a real housewife. <laughs> How weird is that? She's in, know. That, she's in that like, classic meme where the two women are like tearfully arguing with someone. It's insane. Insane. Uh, and good, then good for good for I will say good for the people who made Halloween kills like actually bring her back. And, and she actually gives a pretty OK performance in this, too. Like, I think she's able to transcend the Real Housewives stuff a little bit. I, I, I got to comment on it after. And then we also okay. get Nancy Jane Stevens back as the, the nurse. In in this one, this is the second time she's had like this role where she like she comes back as the nurse Marion Marion Chambers because she did it in H two O as well. Okay, the nurse who survived. Um, exactly. Uh, my biggest critique of the Scooby Dang Scooby Gang that we just get introduced to is that it felt that they were only interested in Anthony Michael Hall. It sounds like they all had microphones. Anthony Michael Hall's microphone was like turned on <laughs> and everyone else's was turned off. Like, but they didn't they, tell them. <laughs> they had lines. They said shit. But fuck, Greg. I, I, you could like Nancy Stevens, the, the nurse, when she was talking, I was like, how is her audio not getting picked up right now? Yeah. It was just yeah. really weird that they, they were just like 
we really don't fucking care about you. <laughs> like you're here for nerd bait. Yeah, I guess it's. I can see the the need to like for to keep the audience engaged to like focus on just one of them. Yeah, but yeah, Anthony Michael like, Hall's yeah. Tommy is definitely more engaging. Um, obviously because he's like a a real actor, so he's able to emote and do stuff. Right, they picked the right one, that's for sure. Exactly, and then also with the Scooby Gang is Lonnie. He's now older. Um. And he's a, the dad of Cameron, who is the one that cheated on uh, Allison, Lori's. Right? Yep, Allison. Allison. Yeah. I should really just say her name. Cheated right. on Allison in right. Halloween. I, I liked the mood that Anthony Michael Hall is setting in the bar. They're essentially having like a, um, what do you call it? It's not a vigil, but like a um, remembrance. I'm sure there's a word for it. Yeah, these, these, these people are are assembled to remember the events of Halloween, but there's also a ah, shit like a, like a contest going on. What do they call it? Like when you show off your skills, a talent show, a talent show going hey. on. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not stupid. Um, <laughs> the podcast where we try to remember words. Exactly. So there's like a talent show going on and then Tommy sets up, steps up and he's like, Hey, you know, just remember in 1978, Michael Myers came to Haddonfield and killed all these people. And he does like a really great job of setting the mood and setting the tone. And as of right now, everyone, the masses are unaware that Michael Myers is back. Yes. And yeah, I think it's, they, they put this at the perfect part because the, he's Anthony Michael Hall's character. He's like, he's priming this drunk bar crowd to become the angry mob that it does. Yes. Um, so yeah, he he does a great job of doing that, and you can see the the gang is kind of like holding and hugging each other because they're obviously emotionally touched mm-hmm. by Tommy Doyle, um, and everyone is you know kind of cheering, and then everyone's like, yeah, you know, I do kind of remember that coming up to him and talking and stuff. What I find really weird is Tommy Doyle obviously must have moved to like fucking New York or something like that because <laughs> Anthony Michael Hall is putting on some like New York accent and shit. Yeah, not not an Illinois Midwest accent. That's yeah. for damn sure. Um, but even at at one point during a speech, they do flashbacks to the original 1978 Halloween classic. And they show some of the uh, characters that obviously they can't bring back because they're all dead. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> But they're showing, you know, like PJ Souls and stuff like that, which is it's just really nice when you get to see those classic characters come yeah. back. Um, and I think it's I think that's good that they did that, too, because I think like we're, we're you know, we're fans of the original. But I think I, I would have struggled to visualize some of these characters as kids because there were a lot of kids in that original. I, I'm glad they flashed back to kind of like line us up with, oh, OK, I think Michael Hall is that kid. Real Housewife is that little girl. I go, OK, got it. Just exactly. a little bit, you know, a little bit to line it up in your head for you. And then we cut to Michael or Laurie Strode, his, her daughter and Allison are, are driving away or being drove away from the flaming wreckage that is Laurie's house. Mm-hmm. And then like the, she sees the firefighters come in and she's like, no, just let it burn. Let it burn. Oh, I'm crazy. JB Lee Curtis. <laughs> um, <laughs> Grandma, that's not your name. Exactly. Like I, I, I saw Dan Aykroyd in fucking New York. You didn't, you didn't <laughs> see those bad sequels. I was in there, bad, yeah. <laughs> so bad. Um, <laughs> and the the firefighters are trying to put out, you know, the flaming, smoldering wreckage that is Laurie Strode's house, and they unleash Michael Myers. Uh, when we last saw him in Halloween 2018, <laughs> he was trapped inside of a makeshift cage of sorts in the basement yep uh and he's left to burn which if that was the end of halloween how great of an ending it is but unfortunately the heroics of firefighters set him free and thus ensues the carnage and macabre of michael myers easily dispatching firefighters with like uh (laughs) their own tools their their own tools he's got like a crowbar of sorts and like a fucking uh what is it called? Like the jaws of life, essentially like that, right? Like he's just like ripping these firefighters apart. Yeah. And it's like, I, I actually like this as, as a plot device to get him out of there. Like these, these poor firefighters go into rescue, like people who are in there and they inadvertently end up rescuing Michael Myers. And that's just such a cool. And then he kills them all. Like yes. what, 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 a, what a, what a great memorable way to do it. That doesn't feel cheesy. Like he just, 
he just somehow survived and we don't see how exactly there's like there's actually like a scene showing it and it's and it exactly. is great i liked how when michael myers emerges in the door frame of the house without saying a word all the firefighters take their tools for <laughs> saving people's lives and they shift their bodies and their posture to like we got to fucking kill this guy combat mode like, yeah we don't know what just happened in here but we do know <laughs> that we have to kill him <laughs> it really right? it really is a great like oh shit collective oh shit moment for those firefighters like they just know that this guy is he means business yeah he's bad news bears uh, but <laughs> none of them none of them stand a chance michael myers <sighs> kills no. them fairly easily fairly quickly and i will say i'm going to say it's because they're in their firefighter uniforms bogged down by the weight of their jackets and the masks air tanks and everything and yeah. masks and everything else like that michael myers has years of doing this um and in fact he lost years doing this yeah he, <laughs> he <laughs> we can say that halloween four five six seven eight were just dreams he was dreaming of doing this he was, uh, he right? was in the holodeck <laughs> yeah exactly training. um but as as he dispatches all the firefighters we cut to a hospital and i was like okay we're doing halloween 2 ah, again wink wink nudge nudge this is, this is very halloween 2 and there it's a lot of chaos of getting laurie strode admitted to the hospital and it seems like the realities of the world are setting in and people are starting to realize that maybe something is going wrong uh and then we see uh an anthropomorphic blob that somewhat resembles charles cypher uh lee bracket from the original <laughs> 1978 film how great and sad it was to see him again oh i mean right you kind of like when i saw his name in the credits i was like oh man they brought him back and it's been a long time since we've seen charles cyphers in something and then we see charles cyphers and the reality of him being 82 sets in pretty heavily yeah it's kind of yeah the, the years weren't kind <laughs> yeah um and i will say straight up right now they wasted the opportunity to do anything with the lee bracket character in this film uh they had a chance to do something they had a chance to maybe you know pivot left but they went right and i think while it was great to see him and have him in scenes, they didn't utilize him to the best. Yeah. I mean, I guess th but they, he's also they, an 82 year old man. Yeah. I was going to say he's an old guy. And, and they also, they like, they brought back a lot of other characters from that first movie. It's, I think it's probably too much to ask that they all get like their moment. Otherwise it would just feel too fan servicey, but. And you know what? I do agree with you, Greg. They filmed two fucking films back to back. They could have saved Sheriff Brackett. They could have saved oh, yeah, exactly. Tommy Doyle. Like Dude. they definitely blew their nostalgia wad in this <laughs> film. Uh, yeah, they should be as, as, as many faults as the Rise of Skywalker had. At least like those, the Star Wars sequels, they they knew to spread out the original series characters. They 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 saved Lando for the third one. They spread them out. They could have <laughs> they saved here. Luke for the second one. Exactly. Fuck Ryan Johnson. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> but so we, we get to the hospital and then, you know, the, uh, everyone's kind of breaking down what's happening. And the sheriff from the first film is talking to the survivors, Allison and uh, Judy Greer is back. I, I love Judy Greer in this film. As She's Karen, amazing. Yeah. The daughter of uh, Lori Strode. And they're all kind of just giving their accounts of, you know, we fought Michael Myers, we won, he's being burned alive right now. And the sheriff gives the grim news that he actually survived. Um, and he's like, no, wait, wait, no one told you. Yeah. It's what a, a great, great moment. Cause they're, they're like, they're interviewing, they're interviewing the granddaughter and, and Judy Greer separately. But you can tell like they, they sync up, like they get that same news at the same time. And you, when you hear them both react to like yells and screams, really, really awesome edit on that. Yes. We also see them operate on Laurie Strode. I don't want to don't want to like get rid of that that moment, because I think that's one of the few moments in the film 
where I was like, ew, gross. Like we're seeing her guts, <laughs> right? Like it's such a, I think medical stuff is creepier than watching some dude's face get bashed in. Yeah, there's something, uh, it, it bring, it's like way more grounded, I think, because that's stuff yeah. that actually happens. Yeah, because because Lori gets, I don't remember the exact injury, but she gets stabbed in the gut by Michael in yeah. Halloween 2018. Like, And that's the surgery we're seeing is them like kind of stitching her back up. And yeah, you, you see in to that, like, cavity you see her do her stomach her stomach yeah. hole um, <laughs> do her stomach hole <laughs> yes and yeah it, it's it does it has a, it has a a much different impact than the kind of over the top gore you get elsewhere in the movie but one of the one of the tropes in movies that i absolutely hate and they do it twice in this film is like as as they're doing the operation and they're talking to someone there's someone in the background that goes like oh yeah they're going to be okay they're going to survive <laughs> um that doesn't really happen in doctor offices doctors never give that like a hundred percent assurance they're like oh we think they'll be fine because they can't tell you that you know a hundred percent they're gonna be okay because they could fucking die at any moment yeah really that oh whoops lori died of an infection whoops sorry exactly. i got it wrong they got sepsis uh <laughs> we we then cut to an older interracial couple and they're fucking adorable I love I these know. two. That's, I think that's one of the biggest pluses for me about 2018 and this one is all of the kills feel way more memorable because they take a, they take a beat or two to set them up and, and, and endear you to them. And the, the, the funny banter between this old couple is just on point. You love them immediately. Yeah, the old... Because it, it, it's kind of like the dynamics are a little bit inverted. You have the older woman flying the drone and having fun and then you have like the man who's who's essentially going like i like drinking wine yeah, here put, drink this wine put, with me put that stupid toy down and pay attention to me yeah uh but unbeknownst to them the shape has <laughs> entered <laughs> their <laughs> house <laughs> and just the first kill is the drone uh he just kind of crumbles <laughs> up the drone and tosses it back because they like uh, she like flies it into like a dark closet and she's like yeah. oh, stupid stupid cheap toy and then some someone or something throws it back out and it's like all crushed up but what i love is like her background acting is as the husband is going to investigate the spooky dark area like a dumbass if you if you watch her she grabs a bottle she's like ready for action she like in (laughs) she holds it in a way where you don't drink it that way right um (laughs) she spent enough time living next to laurie strode like she knows weird shit can happen Exactly. Uh, as the man goes, investigates, he turns on a light and we get a quick flash of Michael Myers. You actually do hear like pill bottles and stuff like that being opened. So there is like some some human factor of Michael Myers going on right oh. now. He is like definitely healing himself because he's in the shitter. Uh, <laughs> I must have I must have missed that. So it's probably everyone hooting and fucking hollering. Um, yeah, probably. <laughs> as, as the man freaks out he starts essentially like telling the wife to call the cops and michael myers just brutalizes this man he pulls him through a fucking window he starts beating the <laughs> shit out of him uh i it think is... it i think at this point more or less is where my quote of the week comes in because of course i'm going to do a quote of the week even though it's a special episode the, the 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 wife i think says something to the effect of like what does he want and the, uh, the husband responds with, who gives a shit? Call the yes. cops. <laughs> There's a big fella in our bathroom and he's wearing a monster mask. Oh, what the fuck does he want? Who gives a shit? Call the cops. Exactly. <laughs> he's so smart. It's oh. so, it's so smart. Yeah. What, what, what um, a great, what a great send up of like horror movie tropes. Like, some try to reason with it. Call the freaking cops. Who cares? <laughs> They're trying to kill us. I love it. So I good. think I, I will honestly say all these side characters that we get introduced to that gets dispatched, they're more enjoyable than the main characters that we follow throughout the film. Yeah, which is kind of an I unfortunate think they, thing. They they get more these these people get more personality. Uh, I understand that we had a whole movie with Tommy, but I need to get reintroduced to him as the older Tommy, right? Give us uh, some time with him. Yeah, the wife unfortunately gets dispatched in a horribly gruesome way uh michael myers takes a a light bulb a smashed tube light bulb and just 
pokes it right through her fucking neck. Oh man, and, and I think the th- I mean these these kills are definitely brutal. But the thing that makes this one so bad for me is the sound, like the gurgling sound you get from her when she has this fluorescent bulb in her neck. Ugh. Yeah. And Creepy. she's still alive and she watches Michael Myers grab her now dead husband and he just repeatedly stabs different knives just, into her back. Her, like, yeah, just like turns this poor guy into like a human pincushion. Now it's here's brutal. my other my other this is an internal issue with the film that I have. I felt at multiple times in this movie and I don't know why I thought Michael Myers was going to say something. Really? Um, like you thought like he, he like stood and paused for a witty one liner, not, not like a witty one liner, but like maybe some kind of like self actualization or like, like a sound of frustration as he was stabbing that guy with like the different knives. Mm, Cause you definitely see, yeah, it's that, it's got that like little kid throwing a tantrum feel to it. Exactly. I see what you're saying. Yeah. And he is capable of talking because like in the original Halloween 1978, Sam Loomis talks about how like he had sessions with Michael and then he just eventually shut down over time and became mute. Right. So it's just kind of, I, I don't know why, but there were multiple moments and this was one of them where I kind of expected Michael Myers not to like maybe talk, but to like just groan make, or show some kind of like frustration yeah, over his sound predicament. Um, but it never happens again. hundred percent. My issue. This is me like projecting <laughs> onto the movie. We need to release the fill cut where there's exactly a, where there's like the groans edit in post. <laughs> <sighs> because <laughs> as he's stabbing the guy i could have been like man i would be like motherfucker like Lori strode fucked me up or something like that <laughs> just like taking out his anger on this poor guy's back <laughs> yeah like a diehard moment right where like yeah. john mcclain's talking to himself about the frustrations of the predicament eh, come out to Lori's cabin we'll have a few laughs <laughs> get my hands cut up <laughs> my hands uh, cut. <laughs> uh, we cut back to the bar and they do this really great scene where everyone's phones start going off yeah. and we, everyone starts to slowly realize that Michael Myers is back. Oh, and he's alive. Shit. And, um, two, two highly disposable characters who follow Tommy, Lindsay and Lonnie, um, as they're leaving the bar, they go to their car and they're like, oh, shit, Michael Myers is in my car because they do a really great callback gag of the car is filled with um, not, not fog or smog. It's like the, the, the windows are fogged up, right? And that's how yeah. they got Annie in the first one. He's in the back seat and he strangles her. Right. Because the, the windows are all fogged up. And the they they run back into the bar and they're like, oh shit, Michael Myers is in my car. Uh, <laughs> we don't we and, don't see a face, we don't see a mask, we just see like a rough outline of a person, of of a person, of a thing. And then Anthony Michael Hall comes out with a baseball bat that has a name, and apparently we're supposed to fucking care about this. Old it's called Huckleberry. Like, I I almost said old, old Sweetback or something old, like that. <laughs> old Huckleberry. Old Snaggletooth. Like as if it's like a callback to the first one. I even thought for a second, like, is is the baseball bat in the first movie? Like, yeah. am I supposed to fucking care about this bat? I was I was scratching my head for like a, a solid minute or so while watching, this, like trying to f- remember if that was a callback to something. I, I I don't think it is. Um. Yeah. And then, as the news is on, we you know we see that they're like, oh, there's two uh escaped patients that we don't know their names. But here's pictures of them, and one of them is is pretty much Ron Howard's brother, uh, and then the other <laughs> one who's Michael Howard, Myers yeah. is is just obscure. But the fact that they had the pictures, but they don't have the names of the people, it's kind of weird. But anyways, that's horror movie logic. Um, <laughs> Hand waving for plot reasons. But Tommy Doyle comes out with old Huckleberry, and he starts beating the car, and then the car drives off, and it smashes into a junction box. 
and the the gang is all riled up and they're surrounding the car and by gang i mean like there are multiple people <laughs> ready to kill whoever's inside of this yeah, car a, a bar full of like buzzed you know boomers who are just ready to unload on something <laughs> bar boomers um and as they get there they realize that no one's in the car and it's actually the clint howard looking motherfucker and he's like around the corner breathing really heavily and Obviously, he's from Smith's Grove Sanitarium, so he's insane. Um, I, I thought it was a really good kind of like bait and switch moment. Like they're going to hunt down someone. They're going to hunt down the wrong person. Yeah. Right? Oh, yeah. It's what, per- perfect setup. Uh, and then we cut back to the next best characters in the film. Big and Little John. <laughs> Big John, Little John. Woo. Which I will say, I, I will tell you later on what I thought the twist was going to be okay with these two and I thought it was going to be really great but we get introduced to a elderly gay couple big john and little john and they're they're relaxing on halloween night and some kids punk them uh, (laughs) in a really great way I don't want to I almost I don't want to say it because I think it's like one of the it's it's a definitely a good like gotcha moment in the film yeah I loved it. Uh, and they're wearing silver shamrock masks I from know. Halloween three. So, okay. So to set up what happens, they, these kids, um, like they ring the doorbell of the house. You think of their trick or treaters, but like one of the little girls is like, Oh my gosh, my friend, she's really sick. She swallowed a razor blade. Come help. And like, you know, one of the, I think big John follows her out and or they follow her out to the, to the street where the daughter, the, the friend is like laying on the side and there's like, there's like, you see blood and I don't know, like puke or something on the, on the barf. Yeah. Barf. Yeah. Like, <laughs> And and of course, like they're just like punking them. Like while while they were distracting them, their their third friend went into the house and like unloaded all the candy into their bag. And they said, "Ha ha, got you!" The 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 kid gets up off the sidewalk, and they, you know, yeah, they got punked big time. It was awesome. Exactly. Uh, and then the the couple scare the kids by going like, "Hey, you just entered Michael Myers' house," and they kind of give the history of Michael Myers to them, and they scare the kids away. Now, I again. I think Big John and Little John, great characters. They're both the, the biggest issue. Again, this is a Phil issue. They're played by comedic <laughs> actors. Michael McDonald, who is from Mad TV, mm-hmm. um, and another guy named Scott MacArthur, who is from a really great show that got canceled within two seasons. It's called The Mick. He plays this character named Jimmy. The Mick was... Uh, the one that starred Caitlin Olsen, which oh, essentially she that, plays okay. Sweet D and just in the different, just a different universe. Setting. Sweet D and, show. Yeah. And Jimmy is essentially just like the Charlie uh, of that TV show. Uh, so like when I saw them, I was like, okay. Like I kind of giggled to myself. Um, yeah. It was, it's, it's, a, it's definitely another one of those things where I, I, I didn't hate it at first, but I was almost kind of like, uh, okay. Like, I wasn't sold on it right away. I eventually was hard sold into loving these guys, but it's, yes. it's, 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 it didn't feel, it kind of felt like stunt casting almost. Oh, but... definitely. Cause they're, they're those guys. Yeah. You know who they are, but you might not know who they are. Yeah. Um, re- rec- yeah. Recognizable character actors who you've seen and doing funny, goofy things. We go back to the hospital. They bring in Lee Brackett not Lee Brackett. That's a different character. They bring in Hawkins into <laughs> Laurie Stro- <laughs> into her room. There's a lot of confusion. Allison and Karen are arguing uh, because Allison wants to go out and hunt Michael Myers. And Karen obviously wants her to stay behind and stay safe. But Allison feels like this need and drive to go and find Michael Myers and kill him because she feels partly responsible for all the events that have happened, though she really shouldn't because Michael Myers got escaped because of Dr. Sartain. Yeah, so, really, it's like that's the only guy to blame. And he got his head crushed like a birthday cake. So we're, yeah, no one should really feel bad. Exactly. Uh, but the Scooby gang assembles Tommy, old nurse, Lindsay, Lonnie. <laughs> <laughs> Cameron and flashback and gang. Exactly. They all assemble. They all uh, break up into mini squads and they, they go out into the Halloween night to find Michael Myers. 
and um, the B squad, which is filled with <laughs> the disposables, such as Lindsay <laughs> and the nurse and the two other people they come up on to some kids that are in a, a playground. They're having fun, just fucking about. Right. But it's the it's the same kids that we saw Big John and Little John interact with, except right. this time there's only two. Uh, as Lindsay approaches them and is like, hey, you need to get out of here. They go like, oh, yeah, there's some creepy guy playing hide and seek with us or peekaboo or whatever. And it's Michael Myers. He's like, oh, yeah, there he is. And then we, yeah, we see him in the distance holding the blood soaked mask of a child. Yep. The third friend from that posse, which immediately I was like, "Ooh, like, OK, I know in Halloween 2018, he killed the the chubby, uh, pathetic guy. Uh, he kind of deserved it because he was a sex pest. <laughs> a sex pest. Yes, exactly. Uh, but this kid, <laughs> he just punked a gay couple. I don't really think he deserves the the Michael the Myers treatment, seen <laughs> gruesome death that he got. Yeah. Right. But Lindsay springs to action. She's a smart fucking character. Right. I, I really appreciate yeah. that, that they didn't make her a damsel in distress. Um, she she immediately grabs a Halloween sack and starts filling it up with bricks and the kids run yeah. off. And uh, Michael Myers is doing that. He's doing the hits. He's doing the old gag that he did to the nurse in the first film where he gets on top of the roof and he starts fucking with the. The windows and spooking people inside of it. <laughs> And it's just it's it's a really good callback without it being like, hey, member, like eat these member berries. Um, <laughs> eat these member berries. I, I do like that the nurse, speaking of the disposables, I like that she got finally disposed of in yes. basically the same way that she, like in the same situation that she survived the first time. Exactly. Cool. She, because she kind of like in the first one, she took cover in the car and she like bolted and she's like fell into a ditch and this one she opens up the car door and instead of running she confronts michael myers with an empty six shooter and click then click she just gets fucking stabbed repeatedly <laughs> um one of the disposables in the back gets stabbed in the eye which was gruesome as shit oh it was God. so gruesome haven't was it you who told me like you've got a thing about like eye yes eye violence yeah i was wondering I, how you reacted to that kill horrible it was absolutely horrible it's like I, some something about the eyeball popping yeah i was gonna say like the, it's really gruesome in this case because like the the knife goes in like just above the orbital like the bottom of the orbital of the eye and it like pops the uh, guy's eye out and he's still alive and moving it around it's mm. really graphic. And I was like, poor Phil and other like yeah. eye sensitive people are probably just like squirming in their chairs on that one. The only thing that could have made it worse if they somehow ripped out his fucking fingernails. Oh my God. <laughs> bomb. Um, <laughs> but Thankfully, Michael Myers isn't quite that much in like torture porn territory. Exactly. If this was like missing an action Halloween edition, then yeah, maybe. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Michael Myers meets hostile. And then comes like, I, I'm, I'm really... I'm really like beset on this next kill because the one of the other disposable characters comes up and she's she's like firing a desert eagle at Michael Myers and missing at every shot. And Oof. while it is funny, it's also kind of unbelievable. As she gets closer to the car, Michael Myers kicks the door, which turns the gun towards her, and pulling she, the trigger, yep. and she kills herself. She Close essentially her kills herself. Off. Yep. I which, like, I I got the impression that even Michael was kind of surprised that that worked because there was like half a beat after that where he just kind of like stared. Yes. He's like, well, exactly. that was easy. He does like the he does like the dog head thing, <laughs> right? <laughs> like that the tilt to the side. Yeah, like, oh, how about that? And then Lindsay comes up like a fucking champ and starts beating him with a literal sack of bricks. Hell yeah. To the head. Now, Greg. David Gordon Green in the first one was like, Michael Myers is just a dude, right? Like we have gone back to there's no circle of the thorn, which you probably don't even know what the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> nope. That's um, a band, right? Yeah, exactly. There's no like <laughs> voodoo witch doctors. There's no super creepy cult that's keeping Michael Myers alive. We have said that Michael Myers in Halloween, Halloween 2018 in Halloween Kills is mm -hmm. just a man. It's a flesh and blood. And he just got hit with a literal sack of bricks. And he's still going. Yep. This, at, your, yep. at this point, 
are you questioning this? Oh, it, I'm, I'm so glad you said it. at this point, like in my notes, that's, that's where I have this kind of like turn in my mind of like, wait, what's going on here? Like we're clearly beyond horror movie logic where he could reasonably take some decent beating and still get up. But like one, I mean, this is probably weighs as much as him and this somehow this lady is swinging it. He would be on the ground. He would be. Yeah, he'd be for the lack of a better term. He'd have a, he'd have a TBI, right? Like he would be simple Jack at this point. Um, <laughs> he wouldn't be he wouldn't be fighting Lindsay, which is immediately what he does. He like starts fighting back and Lindsay yep. almost almost takes the mask off, which, again, I really like. Yeah. Um, I think that is his weak. Well, obviously it is. We'll see. But it is his weak spot. It's his Achilles heel. He needs that mask. Yep. When you start fucking with that mask, that that you shift his focus to getting the mask back or keeping the mask on, which, yeah, definitely yeah. comes back later. It's, we'll, we'll talk about that. But I think that, again, this lady, she is smart as a whip going for that mask. Like, she knows how to survive. And then she's as she runs away from Michael Meyer, she does the smart thing of like she runs, she stops, she turns around, she sees where he's at, she runs, she stops. Like she keeps kind of like repeating this mini process until she hides in a river, right? And then Michael Myers it loses her and he walks off into the night. Uh again, kind of showing that, yeah, he doesn't have that that predator radar where he's just like, Oh, I know you're here. Right. Like he's just a man. What an awesome, awesome crossover. That would be. (laughs) You're right. Predator and Halloween. How awesome. (laughs) It it was. Yeah. It would be something, but uh, we get, I think it's, I think it's really smart. Like they show his human side, but again, like, yeah, they're starting to make you question. Yeah. Whether or not Michael Myers really is just a man. Um, and then we cut back to the hospital and I, I, as, as much as it pains me to say, I think everything Laurie Strode does in this film, just because of the situation that she's in relegated to a hospital bed is fucking boring. Yeah. It definitely suffers from that, like that sequel syndrome where you either you're cutting between too many different groups of characters and and inevitably one of them becomes the boring exposition group. That's kind of what happens to her. Honestly, they should have just I don't want to play the the movie producer, movie writer role this at this point, but I'm going to. They should have just had her in a coma for the entire film. She should have just been out. Right. Like we cut back to characters around Laurie Strode. We don't need to hear from her. Yeah. Just yet. I, yeah. Especially especially if this is a trilogy where like she kind of takes a breather in this one and it's other characters reacting around her, like you said, and then you bring her back for the third one to have some meaningful impact. Yep. Um, But again, we go through the same process and this is again, this is, this is a ding against the movie. We go through the same process now with Lori. Oh, we killed Michael Myers. Well, did we? No, we didn't. (laughs) Did we? (laughs) Did we really kill him? Are you Uh, sure? And then we, then we cut back to the Scooby Gang. Uh, they're investigating the, the Lindsay, and they they find her car. And Tommy and Lindsay and Lonnie and others. They're they're finding all the dead bodies. They eventually find Lindsay. She's safe. She's fine. She's a little worse for wear. Um, probably pissed her pants, which you can't really blame her. Nope. <laughs> and then. To break the tension, we go back to Lori and Hawkins, and they're they're discussing their past of previous amorous adventures. Which I, it's nice that they have a character moment because I I did feel in Halloween twenty eighteen that they had some kind of connection, um, sexual connection. <laughs> um, and I, they do need something like this. So I can't really fault this one. It just feels very out of place. It feels like this is an act one conversation, not um, act two leading into act three. Yeah. In the middle of, you know, the shit, basically. It kind of slows the movie down too much, like you said. Exactly. And then we get to the, the hour mark. That's right, kids. This episode is too long. And you know what that means. We're going to hang it on a cliffhanger. So tune in next week for the conclusion of this special discussion. 
of Halloween kills. Haddonfield, 2018. The citizens of this small, quaint Illinois town are on the hunt for a loose madman. Will they be able to find him in time? Will Laurie Strode get out of a hospital bed? Is Tommy Doyle a compelling character? All of these will be answered in today's episode of That's Canon. Um, almost precisely the hour mark. Everyone now is in the hospital besides Michael Myers spoilers and Charles Cyphers <laughs> starts to do stuff. Essentially Charles Cyphers plays mega boomer in this movie along with Tommy. <laughs> my, 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 my mega boomer. <laughs> exactly. Where they start to incite uh, fear and anger and frustration with inside the masses of Michael Myers is out there. And they come up with a horrible tagline of evil dies tonight, which I swear to fucking Christ, Greg, if I hear that fucking thing in <laughs> Halloween ends, I'm going to leave. It was so frustrating because at after the hour, yeah. mark, it seems like they said it all the time. They did. I, and it, it almost like it, it was really cringy right from the beginning because they say at the bar once or twice too in the very beginning and it just it just like picks up over this up, up to this point where like you said it's every other line is evil dies tonight i almost i think it's intentionally annoying it it has to be it almost i i and again i don't want to get too political but i wonder if it's kind of like the make america great again kind of angle where Oh, like, trying to send that up a little bit, yeah, yeah, exactly. Because it kind of it kind of feels like they're kind of shitting on that. Which, um, yeah, and I think that like that's that's why it makes me think it's intentional because it like it, it it makes you hate this stupid angry mob that is getting kind of whipped up into a frenzy by uh by the vigilantes at this point basically because they're they've got like no faith in the police in the, in the system quote unquote they're gonna take matters into their own hands. I I think that annoying chant helps you hate them the way that you should at this point like from a narrative perspective exactly and the cops are almost like helpless at this (laughs) point because the mob is so large yeah that they they can't help but do anything especially like the the sheriff from the the first film he kind of he kind of takes a step back and he kind of just like surveys everyone's fear induced panic um and like I, i i did enjoy how easily it is to stir people up because as we've seen recently it is very easily to stir a mass of people yeah um but yeah it's just like say something else anthony michael hall i know you're you're told to fucking say these words but come on you're a veteran in the in the industry you got this like i trust you you're rusty (laughs) from national lampoon's vacation uh (laughs) and then uh, like they get the bad bit of information that Michael Myers is actually in the hospital. <gasps> and at that point we cut back to our favorite characters, big and little John, big John, little John, the waggle dance is how bees communicate. They share the information where the flower is with the rest of the colony. They communicate the precise location by shaking their butts. What is in that honey? Hey, mom, he wants to talk to you. Which, okay, so Big John and Little John, they're at home, they're chilling, they're eating fucking honey. They got one of those charcuterie boards and they're shit. Fancy. These delicious. Two, oh yeah, and plus the new the Myers house looks fantastic. Oh yeah, now. did we say that before? They live in the old. They live in Michael Myers' old house, and they did a great renovation job on it. Oh yeah, it looks um, beautiful. So now they start hearing spooky sounds that go bump in the night 
And this is where I'll pause and say, I thought these two were going to be low key serial killers because they bought the Michael Myers house. They obviously are like getting off on having it too. Right. Like they love scaring those kids. That's true. Uh, And then they start doing like the really smart thing of, okay, like obviously we're going to investigate the spooky things that go bump in the night. Big John grabs a knife and he's like, I have this knife. And little John grabs a knife. He's like, I've got this knife. And as they start to split up, but investigate, they call out to each other. Big John and say like, John. Yep. And that this room is clear and that room is clear. And I was like, these two are fucking serial killers. I see. So you were thinking like, they're almost like, they're almost a little too prepared for this scenario. Like they've done it before. Like they've hunted people before, basically. A hundred percent. And I was a hundred percent wrong. Right. (laughs) And it was so sad. So sad. I didn't because... even, that didn't even it didn't occur to me. That would that would have been cool. I'm, I'm happy with how it played out, but that would have been cool too. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not disappointed with how it played out. Um, you definitely, they, they've they earned the sadness that comes with the death of Big John and Little John. Uh, I think Little John gets it worse because he gets stabbed in the armpit, uh, which there is no coming back from that. Even if, even if Michael Myers was to leave and someone was going to try to save him, you can't, you can't tie off an armpit. You're dead. Yeah. Right? No, it looks so brutal. Cause he like, he gets in the armpit and then big John comes in, he sees him on the floor and then he gets his eyes gouged out. Right. Yes. More eye violence, man. Brutal. <laughs> oh my God. It's so brutal. And we're left with just looking at the dead bodies of big John and little John. Oh, but it's again, sad. We we they they spent enough time with them beforehand to endear like they've got little character quirks like calling out to each other and you know like making the fancy the fancy dinner on Halloween like all that stuff makes you like these characters and it, it makes the kills that much more brutal. Exactly. And then we cut back to the has the uh, I I, the I, 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 I I smashed two <laughs> words. I was going to say assholes and hospital. We the, cut back the, to the hospital full of assholes. The assholes. <laughs> the, 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 uh, yeah. The, the, the ass, aspital. Aspital. And the, the fever is high. Even Lori Strode is concerned because she's like, she's pretty much like, this isn't fucking Michael Myers. But everyone in town like it hadn't feel like evacuated their houses and went to this fucking hospital <laughs> and oh, yeah. they're hunting clint howard down hardcore no. and the fucking cops are doing shit all like they got guns they could like fire one in the air i don't know if it, it feels definitely like the cops could have done something more yeah um, to control this angry mob which is i mean yeah i, I guess you can kind of see like there were just so few of them there but you think that as soon as they saw Mm, this thing is going to get out of control. We need to call for be- like riot control backup to get these people to like, calm down, go home. But they didn't exactly. do that. Uh, and then Judy Greer, Karen takes it upon herself to try to save the life of the other escaped mental institute patient, which like, I get it. She probably feels guilty for all the people that have died, mm-hmm. especially her husband. She wants to go out and try to save a life. Um, and she does like a very valiant job. She eventually finds them and she, she locks him in a hallway where she's like, they're not going to break in. Just I'll, I'll prove to them that you're not Michael Myers, but she is just one voice in a sea of a thousand. And she exchanges a longing glance to Tommy who has now realize the error of his ways yeah i like that they did that with a glance too and not some kind of stupid dialogue yeah like you see at that point tommy kind of realizes like oh shit this is out of control i like i like how they did that they even mouth to each other she's like stop them and he's like i can't yeah he realizes it and unfortunately so does clint howard it's too late um, as he cracks open the window from the fourth floor and does a swan dive down to the soft pavement below and explodes <laughs> like a watermelon. <laughs> yeah. And we see the, uh, the outcome of that explosion. Very, uh, he's a pancake. 
He is. And they, I think they do a really good job of humanizing someone who has absolutely no lines. Um, I would have liked to have spent a little more time with him, maybe figured out why he was in the mental institution. Is he just like, is there just, just literally schizophrenic something wrong or something? With him? Yeah. Is he, is he a sex pest? What, what's going on <laughs> here? Cause I do feel sympathy for him. And Karen is devastated. She's not able to save a life. And Tommy now feels guilt because he realized his actions inadvertently led to the death of a man who, as far as we know, didn't yeah. deserve it. I'll say for, for at this point, he's essentially an innocent, although, yeah, we don't know what he did to get into that institution. So, yeah. And Charles Cypher, uh, he rolls up and he's like, this is Michael Myers. Um <laughs> 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 what is that face of the whole prospector well yeah. this ain't michael myers at all darn tootin um nabbit. and then we cut to the sheriff who's like exhausted sitting on the stairs inside the hospital as if he tried to fucking do anything um yeah he's just we like just get like, we get all these shots of just people's reactionary faces and stuff like that yeah um and then we go back to the 70s we go back in time uh and I kind of get why they they waited so long for this part. Uh, and I think it's a good character moment. But again, it's kind of like destroying the momentum of the film. Mm-hmm. Uh, Hawkins is talking about how he accidentally shot his partner and he conspires with another cop to essentially make it seem like he shot himself. There's an exchange of guns and whatnot. And Hawkins reveals that he is the sole reason why Michael Myers is still alive because this version, Sam Loomis was ready to execute him on the front lawn of the Myers house. And that Hawkins single-handedly prevented that from happening. Right. Kind of like knock, knock, knocked his hand away and saved Which Michael Myers life. I can gar- I could, I could see Sam Loomis doing that because he is, as we meet him in Halloween, he's like, <laughs> this dude is pure evil. I shot him six times. Exactly. He's not so too he's, bad. He's ready to fucking throw down and kill some motherfuckers, which is great. Um, <laughs> what a great medical professional, ready to execute patients on the front lawn. Hey, man, I hundred <laughs> percent. No one would convict Sam Loomis of doing that. No, I mean, like he was surrounded by police officers at that point. Like they were pretty much they were prepared to let that happen. Yeah. Um, and then Hawkins kind of he's as he's talking with Lori. He's he's kind of soothing and comforting her in a way of she because she's taking the ownership of everything that's going on because Mm -hmm. she's under the assumption that Michael Myers wants to kill her, that she is the crux, that she is the main character. Right. She's got main character vibes. But Hawkins (laughs) is pretty much like you're not you're just you're just a fish in the way of the shark. And Dr. Sartain brought Michael Myers to you to kill you. He was not after you. He was just he was just swimming in the ocean, yeah. killing. You're just a wrong like a, it was more of like a wrong place, wrong time kind of thing. Which is even better. Like again, like okay. this movie Phew. brings up one of the biggest issues with the original series is that like oh it's Michael Myers' sister, which like for the for Halloween one and two because they resolve it fine, I'll buy it, I dig it. But yeah. then Halloween just turns into Michael Myers needs to kill the new Strode because they they reproduced, right? Yeah. Um, but this one is kind of like Michael Myers is a shark. Yeah, I, I, I'm really relieved to hear you say that you liked it because I that was I thought that was one of the best parts about this movie is that they kind of like de-emphasize Laurie Strode like you're like you you're not the main character. He is just instinct. You were just in yep. the way, and it's it was never about you. It was about really more about the house and home for Michael Myers than it was ever about Laurie Strode. Exactly. I, I love that as a, as a kind of like a, not necessarily a twist, but kind of a, a subversion of your expectation. Twist. Yeah, it's, I guess it kind definitely of is. subverts your expectations. I will hundred percent. I agree with you on that, but then it brings up another issue though, in my mind, which okay. again, like I am on board with Laurie Strode having main character vibes in a, I'm actually a background character in Michael Myers' world, right? Yeah. So then what is it about that fucking room that Michael Myers needs to kill people over? Yeah. Right? Is it just the memory of killing his sister? 
I think that I, I, I don't know. I think that's, I think slash hope that that's something that they explore in the third one. My fear is that they do explore it in the third one. And then we get some fucked up Rob zombie, 1970s, like backwards, pedophile, sex pest, abuse um, (laughs) angle that like Michael Myers was actually like beat the shit out of. And it's like fucking sister, like beat him and stuff. That's actually my fear now. So you you, you would prefer that they not explore too much of his backstory. I can see that. Jeffrey Dahmer is horrifying because by all accounts, his childhood was normal it was normal yeah and he fucking ate people right what's the <laughs> other guy ted bundy he was like a pretty normal dude right like you'd go have a beer with him he seemed normal he killed people right mm. um what's what's more terrifying not knowing who the zodiac was or that the fact that they you know i know they quote unquote solved it but the fact that they never figured it out it's more terrifying that you don't know who the boogeyman yeah. is that's a really good point i i so yeah, they're they've got their work cut out for them in the third movie because they 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 need to talk about it a little bit, but in a way that they don't ruin that mystery you're describing. Exactly. Gonna have to, it's going to be a fine line for them to walk. We'll we'll see what I they do. Sw- I swear, <laughs> if they if they go, his daddy touched him. I'm <laughs> leaving the theater. Like I just I can't. I don't want that in my Halloween films. But either they. I would respect it if they do one of these two things. Either they leave it up to mystery, like you said, which would be very satisfying, or they just they just go totally bonkers with it and say that he's like an alien or something. It would have to almost be something totally bonkers. <laughs> something I would... crazy that like, you know, like you'd almost have to respect the, <laughs> the the balls on the producers for like, wow, like, you went for it. <laughs> they bring back like the circle of thorns from the later series, and they're like, he's actually from the circle of thorns, and like Halloween four, five, and six, and even resurrection actually happened. And <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Well, I mean, I, I've I've got I've got a theory for the third, a crazy theory for the third movie. I'll I'll save that till the end though. Um, so as we progress, we've now, I think everyone has come to the conclusion and the ownership that no one person is ultimately responsible for what Michael Myers has done beyond Michael Myers himself and now Dr. Sartain. They're the only two who actually own ownership of Michael Myers' actions. Um, but we, we start getting, we have now repeated kind of like the background, mm-hmm. the history And everything revolve around Michael Myers. Like this is like the fourth time in this one film. It's a, it's a little excessive and bordering on. I don't fucking care anymore. Um, But everyone has, is now it's, it's kind of weird because the characters of Karen, Lori and Hawkins come to this conclusion that they only care about the house that Michael only cares about the house. And somehow tangentially, through the ether of the world, Lonnie, Cameron, and Allison have also figured this out at the same time. Like, yeah, the, what do they? The moons they, have aligned. I they give some like one line explanation. Like, weren't they like looking at a map and they were mapping out the the where all the kills were happening? And they's like, oh, that makes a straight line to Michael's childhood home. That's some fucking Batman Adam West bullshit, though. <laughs> yeah, I, I almost would have preferred had they just happened upon the house and like hmm, something if, feels wrong let's go check it out if lonnie was just like hey why don't we just go to his house and see if he fucking went there right yeah just like, like following a hunch almost yeah um but as karen is leaving he's talking to she's talking to tommy and essentially like a plan is forming in order to get michael myers but we the audience are left out because it's obviously the reveal for the climax um, we cut back Lonnie and the other two pull up to Michael Myers house and Lonnie goes to investigate and we hear a gunshot and then nothing. And then Allison and Cameron are like, okay, let's we'll roll. go next. Which like they had a little more success. They actually made it upstairs. Uh, but <laughs> Way to Cameron, go, kids. Cameron gets the shit kicked out of them. And because I actually do like him now, I feel bad. And he actually gets pretty brutalized. Yeah, he he. I think Michael play, spends the most time playing with this kill. 
because he's like he's like slamming him all over the walls and bashing his head back and forth in the like on like the on the railing of the stairs and just bashing like, his hand like oh, stomping yeah, too, his yeah. hands too just yeah um, really like working him over before he actually kills him and then Allison is attempting a- Allison from the first movie is pretty smart in that she realizes that guns are ranged weapons and you don't have to be next to someone to shoot someone. But in this one, she forgets that someone invented the, uh, the, the shotgun to go, I want to kill that thing, but from far away, um, because she charges towards Michael Myers with her shotgun, <laughs> the gun. Uh, but she, she could have just uh... fucking shot him. Um, but again, it's a horror movie, horror movie uh, logic. So, <laughs> Allison gets knocked down the stairs. Like her, her leg gets dislocated. It's, it's pretty gruesome. The scream um, she lets out when her leg good. gets broke. It, really, really chilling. Yeah. Good scream. Um, Cameron get, does a, a literal 360 with his head. He's dead. <laughs> he does not survive that part. Does that mean it's in the Exorcist universe? Is he possessed? Yes. And he's doing yes, like the Reagan thing? He's possessed. <laughs> um, <laughs> Allison gets a couple good stabs in Michael Myers and like the gut growing area. Oh, yeah. Which again... Are, are we agreeing that Michael Myers is a man or is he something more than man? It's there. The filmmakers are, are cleverly putting in some over the top injury to kind of desensitize you to that. And this is the, yeah, the next time where you really notice it. Cause yeah, like basically gives Michael the same injury that Laurie had in the, in the previous movie. Yeah. He just motors through it. No problem. Um, as Allison is, Almost accepting the fate of death, Karen runs up and literally fucking snatches the mask off of Michael Myers after she uh, pitchforks him because she realizes that the mask is his Achilles heel. Yeah. And she's she's taunting him and she's like, do you want this mask? Like, you better fucking come and get it then. Yeah. Just. And I, I, I feel dumb in retrospect, but like, I didn't see what she was doing. Like, I, I didn't, it didn't occur to me that she had a plan at Same this here. point. Like, I thought she just snatched it and she was just kind of like going by the seat of her pants and just trying to survive, basically. But, and this, again, I, I'm just going to be honest. I think this is where the ending falls apart. I think uh, uh, this last 10, 15 minutes, the movie completely shits itself. Um, okay. Karen was raised by Laurie Strode to go for the neck and essentially finish him. Right? She should have just kept fucking stomping on his head. Right? Like it should have been over then. But again, we know there's a sequel, and we we know there's ten more minutes left. So Karen runs off with the mask, and she sets it in the middle of a road. Michael Myers goes up puts it on but then he michael myers slowly realizes that there's a gang assembling around him and he's about to get the shit handed to him yeah which again i was like okay like i'm seeing some hints of halloween four here exactly, where at the yeah. end like the cops come up and just start blowing him away um with guns not their mouths and <laughs> <laughs> were we watching different movies <laughs> I was watching a different Halloween, Greg. Uh, uh, <laughs> oh, there's, there's there's a porn parody name in there somewhere. I'll, just give me time. I'll think of it. It's got to be something, right? Um, Halloweener. Halloweener. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and again, I like this sequence. They they start they start kicking the shit out of Michael Myers, and I'm like, okay, this makes sense. This is how they're going to stop Michael Myers in this one. And Halloween ends takes place years down the road where like something happens right my own head canon of what's going to happen but it doesn't we start getting this really mysterious and ominous voiceover from Lori strode about like how the boogeyman thrives off of fear and hate and aggression and that you can never really kill the boogeyman And that she's ultimately responsible for killing the boogeyman, even though 10 minutes earlier, everyone came to the conclusion that no one person was responsible for the boogeyman's existence. Mm -hmm. Um, Charles Cyphers comes up and he says, 
everyone's entitled to one good scare. Blah, blah, blah. And then, <laughs> then Michael Myers starts killing everyone over this voiceover. Yeah. It's so bizarre, Greg. It's so bizarre that we set up all of the, and again, I think this might be a me thing. I don't know. I'll, I'll explain why I think it's bizarre. And then I want to hear, hear your take. Okay. So we just saw Greg or we just saw Greg. We just saw Michael Myers get the <laughs> shit handed to him. It was him, right? Greg the whole time. It was Greg the entire time. And then even, okay. And this is, again, this is like one of the parts where I was like, he's going to fucking say something because the, the, the body language that Michael Myers is emoting is fear. Oh yeah, for he sure. looks when he's surrounded. He looks afraid. He's surrounded. He's a caged animal that finally got surrounded, and he's like, "Fuck, this is it." And I thought maybe there was going to be like a moment, again, like a moment where he tries to say something or like do something. Like this would have been the ultimate twist of him trying to like reason with these people, but he gets the shit kicked out of him. And over this very ominous voiceover given by Laurie Strode about how you can't kill evil. Michael Myers comes up and he just starts killing everyone. He kills literally everyone in the movie that you just got introduced to, that you just saw. Charles Cyphers, he gets dispatched. Uh, yep, the Anthony entire Mike hall gets the killed. Entire everyone mob. gets killed. Again, Greg, and I've been saying this throughout the entire podcast, is Michael Myers a man? I think, yeah, this is definitely, I will 100% agree with you in that this is the love it or hate it moment for probably everyone who sees this movie. I, I think I liked it a little bit better than you. Although I, I I noticed the same things that you noticed, like it kind of, it it feels slightly contradictory, but I, I like the idea of them changing the series up and actually making him supernatural. And I like, and I feel like that's where this scene needed to happen because this is, you get little teases of it throughout the earlier in the movie where he, like, he gets hit with the bricks and he takes knives and gunshots to the face and chest. Like, I feel like you needed this scene to say, okay, like this is it. Like this is the transformation scene. This is where he become, he, he switches from being flesh and blood to something more than that. Cause you, you, you I think Lori uses that word transcends into something else. Yep. I again, it feels like it was an intentional choice to to do it that way, and you need you, so you needed him having like this supernatural. I'm going to kill the entire group single handedly moment. But I can definitely see again that it's love it or hate it because if if people weren't on if you're not on board with him being supernatural, you will hate the shit out of this scene. I, I yeah, you, I definitely agree with you. You said the keyword transcend when I when. I hear that coming from Laurie Strode and I see the characters. I thought someone else was going to transcend into the persona mm, of Michael okay. Myers. Like in number four, how it was supposed they were setting up um, the new, I can't think of her name. Danielle Harris's character. Yeah. The essentially girl. be the Yeah. I thought maybe like Karen was going to transcend into the new Michael Myers. Right. Um, Oh, okay. That, like from the years of trauma, from being raised by her mom, and now all the all the people dying around her, that she, it's just too much for her, and she transcends into it. But it it's very well shot. I think it looks really cool because you don't really get to see too much of the background. It's just these like very stark, quick moments of Michael Myers killing Slash. and stabbing and stuff like that. And like yeah, like it's like a it's almost like in a black void, and you just see him and the person he's stabbing. And it yep. just kind of like switches in. It's, I think it's kind of in slow mo too, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah, it looks really slick. Yeah. And then you see Karen. She's in front of the Myers house and she looks up and she sees the ghostly visage, visage of child Michael Myers, which again, like she's transcending into Michael Myers, right? Um, oh, she goes you thought, up, okay. She goes upstairs and she stands in the spot where Michael Myers killed his sister and you're like it's gonna happen she's gonna become the new michael myers and like Lori is gonna have to fight her own daughter and then we see in the reflection of the window michael myers and you're like and i'm thinking to myself like maybe this voiceover from Lori is like an imagination like it's not really happening you thought it was all in judy greer's head 
Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Because like, it's very quiet. Like the, the, the real life audio is kind of muted. Right. Yeah. You get does it drops out the soundtrack a little bit and it drops out like sound effects. It's just the voiceover and the image of the, <laughs> the mob getting slain. And she even does like this very, like very calm, cool, collected, like breathe in, breathe out. And that's when you see the reflection of Michael Myers. But then you realize that, no, it's actually Michael Myers and she kills Karen. And like we cut to Lori Strode. She's seeing the panic and it's almost like she's having that mom, that parent sixth sense of like, there's something wrong with my kid. Yeah, my family's in trouble, but she's at a distance and doesn't know for sure what the problem is. And then we end with Michael Myers looking out the window of the bedroom. Halloween kills. It's over. That's the film. (laughs) And then I ask David Gordon Green, I conjuring you, is Michael (laughs) Myers a real man? And I have an excerpt from an interview that he recently did, Greg, that is with For Halloween Kills. Oh, boy. My own personal concept for Michael, which will carry forward as long as I'm involved, is that he's capable of spectacular things, but not impossible. He is he is a real man. He broke his own rule. And I think my biggest issue with the film is we've been marching on the orders that Michael Myers is a real man. And everything that he did in this movie was not real. Right? Like, he should have died when Lindsay hit him with the bricks. Yeah. And again, I I, I definitely, I'll go back to what I mentioned before, which I think is, yeah, if the love it or hate it decision for this movie is definitely whether or not you are willing to buy into him doing supernatural things or being supernatural. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to discredit things said in interviews because they can always like, they're being cagey about the plot anyway. And they can just yeah. go back and later like, Oh, well, if you listen closely to what I said, I actually meant blah, 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 blah. Like, yeah. Like he's just in interview, interview mode, but I, I think maybe that's, maybe that's why I was a little bit more accepting of the ending is because I, I kind of like that idea. And I think it's, it probably is just every person's personal preference, like whether or not they want, like they, the, whether they thought it was going in that direction or not. Cause you, you thought it was going to be very grounded and having like the transcendence being from person to person. I can see if you were, if you were had that in the back of your mind as like where it was going, I can definitely understand why that would be frustrating the way that they ended it and the way that they had him taking bricks to the back. Yeah. But I'll let you, I'll let you go first. What, what, what's your star rating or what's like your, your thought on the film? I, I liked it quite a bit. It's, I think I liked it better than 2018. It's probably a four out of five for me. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Those are strong words. And I will, I, res- I, as always, I respect your I respect opinion, your wrong opinions. <laughs> on Zero stars. Unlike, um, unsubscribe. My, my, <laughs> my issue is that, and I think I've, I, I think you kind of picked it up as we were talking. The sub characters were better than the characters that we got to follow. Um, when I watch this movie, I'm going to look forward to re- when I rewatch this movie. I'm going to look forward to Big John and Little John, the, you know, the elderly couple, like some of the other like lower key moments. I, I, again, like Laurie Strode, I'm not upset that I didn't get to see Laurie Strode in this film. I, th- this is how Star Wars should have been. Like we get the big adventure with Luke and then he gets like his ass handed to him. And then for the second movie, he's kind of low key. And then he comes back for the third one with like a vengeance, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm fine with Laurie Strode taking a step back because obviously she's, she's going to have a whole film to herself now uh, again to to get revenge on Michael Myers. She is going to be the shark. Um, right. I, I just think like we, we needed a little more time with with Lonnie and Anthony Michael Hall to kind of realize who they are as characters uh, in this new world. That, that that they've set up um for me it's like a three and a half almost okay. verging on a three i like again i didn't hate it i think there's a lot of great parts but yeah. when you stitch it all together 
all these great parts are held together by like Scooby-Doo transitions of like, we just need to get to this next part. Yeah. And I thought Halloween, the first one had, it did a really great job of like all the meat had a really connective tissue. Um, There's a lot of meat in this film. I just think like sometimes the connective tissue is just not as strong as it could have been dissociated. Yeah. I mean, I think that's probably why it's not, I mean, that's, that's definitely what made it not a five for me. Cause I, I, I really enjoyed those component parts. Like you said, like the kills were brutal. The little character moments were great. The sound was great. It looked great. Like the, the elements of it were all really good. I think really the only thing it, where it stumbled for me was it, it suffered from typical second movie or any any movie where like you, there's a lot of things going on at the same time and you're switching yes. back and forth and like it's always like no matter what some characters are gonna get sacrificed narratively and i, I mean I, I don't know if i can really fault them too much because they i mean they, they would they would have stumbled they would have hit that landmine no matter what but definitely but yeah, it's definitely that that's that's the star off for me is it, it could have been a little bit more focused. Like and I think your 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 suggestion was would be perfect. Like put Lori in a coma, like give a plausible reason why we never have to go talk to her so that we can spend more time with the other interesting characters who are actually doing things. Let Lindsay say something. She said like four lines in the entire film. Like I was kind of interested in seeing her come back. The nurse dispatch her as quickly as possible. Um, Mm -hmm. while she's pivotal in the Halloween universe because she was there with Sam Loomis, she also was five minutes of the film, right? Um, You know, just give these these legacy characters a little more time, especially Charles Cyphers. Like, (laughs) he could have made him fucking dispatch for the cops, and he could have been, like, arranging stuff, you know, in the background. Things that that an old actor can do while sitting in a chair. exactly moving too much yeah or like maybe they just go to him for like advice at one point they're like hey you know they're like lee brackett's still alive maybe he'll have an idea of where to get michael you know Mm -hmm. like obviously put him in the recliner but make what he does worthwhile yeah um i can i can i i agree with you I think if I had to guess the reason that they didn't do something like that, I I think they just were probably trying to avoid coming off too fan servicey. Yeah. I mean, and and again, like I, I want fan service. Like I love that. I eat that shit up, but I can understand for like a, like a mainstream audience. They, they don't want to have too much of that to, to disconnect people. That's probably why they did it. They tried, they tried to focus on like a smaller handful of, of the, you know, the recurring characters. Did you know that um, the nurse, Marion, has she's the only person in the entire Halloween saga to have so far have been killed by Michael Myers twice because she does get killed in Halloween H2O and she dies in this film. Oh, it's an interesting little badge of honor. Michael McDonald, who plays Big John, uh, has the great honor of being killed by Michael Myers twice as well. Uh, Michael Myers in Austin Powers kills him and Michael Myers in this movie kills him. <laughs> uh, 28 dead bodies in this one. Mm-hmm. Only Halloween film where Jamie Lee Curtis and Michael Myers do not meet each other. Oh, I guess I didn't really think about that, but yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, she was in the hospital the whole time, so that makes sense. And, uh, do you want to know what the original ending is? Um, Michael Myers gets beamed up to a, a flying saucer and he's like, my, my, my planet needs me. Pretty much. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's like three minutes that got trimmed off. And it, it's Lori at the hospital. She calls Karen like right before she gets killed. Michael Myers picks up the phone. There's just heavy breathing. And Lori ultimately knows the fate of of her own daughter. Mm, I can understand why they would, because we're going to get that. I can see why they would keep that for the third movie. Yeah, same here. I think that that is definitely like a a good cut, like a good, you know, compromise. That's sensible, yeah. Because that's going to be one of the driving forces, like the driving motivations in the third movie, I think, is 
there, like a, a revenge element like oh michael you you, you killed my family and now I got to go get you back. Like that's that's like an emotional family. thing. Prepare to die. <laughs> you killed my father. Prepare to die. Yeah, exactly. But so, do you want to hear my crazy theory for the third? I movie? cannot wait. And like any good friend, when <laughs> the movie comes out and you're wrong, we're going to replay this. And you're going to have force me to sit down and listen to it while, yes. I'm, while I'm totally wrong. I, <laughs> I will completely it. accept that because this is, there's no way in hell that this is actually going to happen. But Becky and I had a good time talking about this in the car ride home. So I, I have to give credit to Becky for the inception of this idea because she, I think correctly, I think this part is actually accurate that the mask is going to be a major source of power in that, it's like it's a big like whenever whenever we see it we hear it mentioned a lot in this movie and then we also see it hear it like not only mentioned but like whenever he gets people try to mess with the mask he totally switches off and like goes into like chase mode he just needs to get the mask back so i think that i think that will actually come into play in part three mike the craziness comes in i so far i 100 percent agree with you i think the mask is going to play a yeah. pivotal role in it yeah, I think in reality, it's going to be more like symbolic than anything. But the crazy theory is, so you know how the kids had the Halloween three season of the witch masks, right? Oh, my God. Are I you th- about to say it? I am 100% going to say it. I think they're going to bring Halloween three back into canon. I think the Michael Myers mask is like a second generation to the mind control killer masks in Halloween three. We're going to see... A, a silver shamrock corporation logo on michael myers mask and that's why he's so supernatural because this mask is basically giving him like pcp angel dust powers to like blast through pain and like do like you know mother lifting a car to get her son out from under it like taking his strength to 11 i think it's it's going to be a season three season Halloween three season of the witch tie in. It's going to make a canon of it again. What you don't hear right now, because it's going to get put in post, is the dun, 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 <laughs> from Halloween three. The soundtrack, I am yeah. so fucking on board with that. Right? I'm so on board with that. Because it it's a way to make him to tie up the all of the supernatural shit that he's doing while at the same time keeping it grounded in like uh, not really reality but more like a sci-fi reality the other the other the other tangent of that theory was that he's one of the androids that the silver shamrock corporation produces and that's why he oh. can absorb so much punishment he is his mask is different from the kids in that he's absorbing like the souls or whatever because it's like about getting souls in in part right. 3 and because it you know we see that mask take a lot of punishment throughout this movie and it like after it gets burned up yeah you know, by the from between the beginning of 2018 and the end of Halloween kills that mask is just all sorts of fucked up what i'm thinking is that that mask as it absorbs punishment it's like malfunctioning and like juicing him harder than it would normally and it's it's like coming at the expense of his body getting destroyed but that he like he he becomes progressively more and more like superhuman as you, Greg, as you go towards a movie, yeah, towards the end. I, I am always on the thought that if the second in the trilogy is weaker, the third is going to be worse. But if your hypothesis is correct, and we soon get a cease and desist letter from David Gordon Green telling us <laughs> to take down this podcast because you've ultimately revealed the amazing the plot for Halloween Ends, I would be so happy. And they could call it, they would yeah. call it Halloween Ends because evil always wins in some way and <laughs> there's going to be like a massacre of children that die in the you know in to keep michael myers going right like it's going to end mm-hmm. with like Lori getting killed michael seemingly getting killed but then like the souls of some children are going to like revitalize fucking michael <laughs> myers and he's going to come back i am so on board with that idea i think that is a very good a very neat way of tying in like a movie that for like 
a lot of people is a thorn in their side, but they're mm-hmm. fucking stupid because Halloween three is amazing. It's awesome, right? Um, I just I love the idea of that being like a big because I, I feel like speaking of interviews, I think Becky mentioned this. There was like some interview with um uh what's her name? Jeez, Laurie Strode's actress. I'm blanking Jamie on Lee it. Curtis? Jamie Lee Curtis, yeah, where she said like there's like Halloween ends is gonna piss people off or something like that. Oh my god, and she's already what, setting us up. Right? Like, like what what pisses off people more? What pisses off hardcore Halloween fans more than the Halloween three's existence? Oh man, Jamie, you're a national treasure. Greg, you're a fucking madman <laughs> who should be running his own movie studio at this point. Um yeah, I'm I am st- so on board with this. <laughs> I definitely like, you know, as we were like, we definitely Becky and I, as we were like brainstorming this in the car at home like we definitely felt like charlie in that episode of always sunny we're talking about pepe sylvia in the basement and like drawing like little little bits of red yarn between from picture to picture it it feels it feels like that um darth jar jar theory oh definitely we're like people were on board people are on board with that at one point because oh yeah it's, it's so outlandish it's it's almost acceptable because it, it's what you would want to see the ultimate fate of that character because people hate Jar Jar so much. Yeah. Like almost it's like a big, you know, you, you, it's like that, that middle finger that like kind of punk rock element you have to almost respect because it's bucking authority. God damn. That's fucking good. And I'm not even blowing smoke up your ass. <laughs> that is Ooh. fucking good. I like that. So that's, yeah. I mean, that's, that's my crazy theory. And I think it, it, yeah, it goes back to what I said before. Like there's, there's one of two ways it can go where I would respect the third movie in this trilogy. If it gives us, you know, a, a really satisfying, but grounded tie up to this trilogy, or it goes really insane with twists and conspiracy theories. Hell Yeah. And by your theory, you mean mine when I post it on uh, Reddit. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you're you're going to edit. You're just going like, to edit my voice out. You're just going to like record yourself saying everything I'm saying now. <laughs> exactly. Oh, my God. That's a good that's a good theory. I like that. That's, that's go. definitely a good one. Remind me uh, one year from now when Halloween Hands comes out and I look like a fucking idiot. <laughs> no, the thing is, we're going to watch it and it's going to fucking suck ass. And then we're going to listen back to your idea and go, why couldn't it have been this? <laughs> We're going to remember back to the mask idea. Yeah. Oh, you pre-hyped me for something that is like a crapshoot at this point. The hype for ghost for Ghostbusters for Halloween ends now is unattainable because your idea is better than anything <laughs> David Gordon Green is going to come up with. I do like the idea of getting a cease and desist letter. It's like you got you get like this guy's got it. He got it too close. Yeah. He needs that to be eliminated. Be so great. And that's, then they send so great. they send the silver shamrock androids after me because I know too much. Yeah, and uh, Tom Atkins is there, and he puts his like Dilf <laughs> powers on on display. <laughs> his like, Dilf power, yeah. Dilf, yeah, he'd be yeah, he'd be a grandfather oh, now. <laughs> Tom Atkins, what are you doing here? Come in. Look at that mustache. Oh, oh my! Oh, you're gonna stab me? Okay. Ah, <laughs> uh, that's great. That is great. I mean, since it is the holiday season. Of, of Halloween, you know, uh, we can talk about some, I guess, Halloween related stuff. What's your, when you were a kid, what was your favorite candy to get? Hmm. Um, you put me on the spot. I'm going to make a controversial opinion here. And I love the mini Charleston shoes. It, I was about, if you said like <laughs> fucking Necco wafers or something like that, then we'd be done. No, but... Necco wafers are horrible chalk that needs to be purged from the universe's existence but no i i'm one of those weirdos who likes charleston chews and it was one of those things that like would always end up in the bottom of the bag so i would just like yeah more for greg i love that charleston chews have like different flavors though they're like at least nowadays there's like there's a strawberry and a chocolate i think yeah i think i only ever saw the the mini vanilla but oh yeah i would love those things because they were they would last forever they're like if, if you didn't like actually chew on them which would like pull fillings out but like if you just like popped them in your mouth and just kind of like sucked down for a while, they, those things would last forever. There you go. Always the always economical. <laughs> I can see you like talking to your dad. You'd be like, one Charleston chew lasts me an entire month. This is a great investment. <laughs> Thank you, Papa. <laughs> Don't spend it all in one place. Yeah, sound like some <laughs> like Oliver. 
or Charlie was, Bucket uh, from uh, Willy Wonka savoring that Wonka bar for a whole year. I know what a chud, and then fucking Grandpa <laughs> Joe can walk. What an God asshole, damn Grandpa Joe. What about you, Phil? What was your What was your childhood favorite? Yeah, I was. I guess I was kind of weird too because I liked Three Musketeers for the longest time. That used to be my favorite Ooh, candy. That's a solid that's choice. Like a, that's like an old person's candy when you think about it, though, because it's like sweet but not too sweet. Oh my God! Didn't Jamie Lee Curtis do Three Musketeers commercials? I think so. Oh my God! Before Hang she started second. shilling uh, poopy yogurt, Yo- yogurt that makes you shit yourself. <laughs> Activia, Musketeers, Jamie Lee Curtis. The worst candy to get is like the Necco wafer type deals. Smarties are acceptable um, because that's like a lot of sugar. But if it's if it's essentially like a wafer based candy. Where that's like not surrounded by chocolate, get that out of here. And also bags with pennies in them. Yeah, I ain't oh, got gosh. time to no, do that. These things are worthless. But no, yeah, yeah, Three Musketeers is a solid choice. Those are those are pretty tasty. The only the only downside of Three Musketeers is they're so light. I feel like they're just like gone too quick. Yes, you can eat those things in like one bite. So the whole one. I, I'll be honest. When I go through my kids' candy now, because even though I know it never really happens that, you know, razor blades, <laughs> uh, drugs and stuff like that. I still go through it all. Um, dad just tax. to yeah, make myself. Yeah. I take dad tax and I take <laughs> any fucking gummy based candy that he has. <laughs> so if there's dad, like, <gasps> I love the trolley gummy worms. Shut up. Yes. Son. Mine, uh, pretty now. much. I remember one year I was like, you got a bag of fucking Haribo gummy bears. And I Ooh, took them primo. And, yeah. And he knew he was like, those are the good ones. And I was like, yeah, they are the good ones. <laughs> Sorry about it. <laughs> I just walked for two miles. I'm eating these gummy bears. <laughs> I love it. I mean, I think we can both agree that like really, really our favorites were those unicorn houses that would give out the full size. I mean, no question. Oh, yeah. A full I'm... size anything trumps a miniature Charleston chew for me. And I'm down. I when I handed out candy before I had a kid. I always got full size candy bars to give kids because I remember how amazing it was to when you look through your your loot at the end of the night that you got full size candy bars. Um, Mm -hmm. When I was stationed in Japan, we didn't get that many trick or treaters in our area. Uh, They kind of we, we lived in this part of the base that was kind of like annexed away from like everyone else. It was really weird. Out in the boonies. Pretty much. And we would get like a handful of kids. And I remember one night I have still had like 30 full size candy bars. Some kid comes up. I'm like, hey, man, you won Halloween. And I just dumped all of them in his bag. (laughs) I was like, (laughs) I'm done handing out candy. And you turned your light off and that kid walked away a legend amongst his friends. Oh, yeah, definitely. But I I am I am definitely a full size candy bar person. Um, Yeah. So I think we'll see this year how many trick-or-treaters we get. I know COVID is still kind of a thing. So I know people are, are you know being cautious as they should be, but um, that was one of the things I definitely missed last year about Halloween was, you know, putting on a Halloween movie that I've seen a million times so that I don't mind pausing it when trick-or-treaters would ring the doorbell. So, so it's, it's Halloween and the Greg house. What is, I think, especially this year, because it is a Sunday um and i know you're gonna go to dismember the alamo and whatnot um but Woo! it's it's halloween night what movie plays while you while the trick-or-treaters are out like what's yeah. what's the movie well i mean we're 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 going 100 percent cliche we're we're watching 1978 halloween on halloween um nice we, we, we always save it for halloween night it's it's the best, in, not not just because of the title and the fact that it's a horror movie, but that it, it nails the Halloween vibe in probably the best way compared to any other movie. So it just you just you can't you can't you can't beat the mainstays. So that's that's what we're doing. What about you? Hundred hundred percent. It's always Halloween again, like you said. I know it's kind of cheesy. But it's definitely, you know, what we when we get back from trick or treating, even with my kid, we put it on because besides like a flash of boobs, Halloween is pretty tame by most standards. Mm, yeah. Um, and yeah, I, again, I know I'm weird. I grew up watching uh, horror movies. 
But Nancy Keys, who plays uh, Annie in it, was like one of my first crushes <laughs> in film. And so of course, yeah. you got to watch that every year. Yeah. For even like for reasons. And yeah. And as a kid, I didn't like it was kind of weird because my kid recently had the had the realization of time and like watching a movie doesn't mean that it's necessarily due because we watched a Dracula movie from the seventies. And I was like, that was like 50 years ago. Right. <laughs> All these actors are dead now. Exactly. And like <laughs> watching Halloween as a kid and not realizing that this movie was made 10 years before I was born. And, you know, I'm watching it 30 years later and whatnot, you know, yeah. it's just kind of like one of those things where, Yeah like time and whatnot but yeah. yeah halloween is always is always one that we that i watch and then i will sometimes dip into halloween too okay so you go for you go for some of the sequels i think yeah the only, the only reason i don't do that is I, i'm i'm in it more for the halloween like the holiday vibe oh i forgot to mention yeah okay so halloween is obviously the big one you got to go hocus pocus though yep that right? is a. Uh... That is a a family watch every year. Oh yeah, and it's I, th- I think they've got it like in 4K HDR on Disney oh my Plus God. right now. Yeah, it, there's a couple parts like the, the handful of like optical special effects they do it like with the you know the, the lightning out of the fingers and things. It it pops. It looks really good. Definitely check that out if you're uh, insane looking for a backup movie. So, but yeah, I mean the, the classics and yeah, like I said, um, those I go for movies that have good Halloween holiday vibe. So that's what we'll stick to. I love it. I love it. Well, I think that, you know, we talked a lot about Halloween, Halloween kills. Uh, is there anything else that you, you know, anything that you want to touch upon that you've been watching recently? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, we, it's all, it's, it's October. So yeah, we're, we're chugging through our, 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 uh, our, our spooky movie catalog. Um, this year, I think I mentioned in one of the other episodes, we are doing a decades theme this year. So, um, this week, as of the time of this recording was our eighties week, which is a big week, obviously. So um, like I mentioned, we went to go see the thing in theaters, which is always yes. awesome to see on the big screen. One of my favorites of all time. I can't say anything that hasn't already been said about that. Um, we watched, Oh, I actually, the other one I'll mention is another John Carpenter movie that I had somehow gone my entire life without seeing, which is uh, Christine. Whoa. I really? Know. Yeah, I You've saw. You've never it. seen Christine. I hadn't. No, I watched what that for the think? first time. I loved it. I thought it was awesome. It, it was right. probably it's probably one of the better Stephen King adaptations that I've seen. So, I mean, I, I like that it wasn't too hokey with the car being like I, I like we didn't need to know that which the spirit of who was possessing the car. It was just an evil fucking car, man. And I was is awesome. Awesome. I'm, I, you know, a lot of people don't like that one. Um, I'm a Christine apologist. I do enjoy Christine. Yeah. I think the uh, the main actor's descent into madness and murder is very good. Oh yeah, that the, I think I feel like the performances of, of of all the main characters, but especially Arnie, I think is his name. Yeah. Really like make that movie work because yeah, like going like the the, the transition from like bumbling, you know, nerdlinger to kind of badass greaser type is so well done. And it's yep. clearly, yeah, because of the car. So yeah, that's the, yeah, it's kind of going through the classics and trying to, trying to st- still see things that I haven't seen before. So what about you? What's, what's been on your catalog? Besides a bunch of X-Files, um, cause you know, you <laughs> always have to watch <laughs> um, murderous incest west virginians uh, <laughs> every year best episode of course and the fluke man which is a just a horrifying design oh man um, i am i am a fluke man apologist i don't know why people hate that episode so much it's it's oh, a perfectly serviceable monster of the week episode when i see horrible design i mean horrifying it's, oh, horrifying, it's like yeah it is it is nightmare inducing i i fear <laughs> for my butt when i when i sit down <laughs> um is there a fluke man in there yeah, exactly. Uh, I watched Night of the Creeps, which is a oh. 1980s horror comedy with Tom Atkins, hey. an- another kid from a-, a different National Lampoon's vacation, uh, European vacation, the one who played Rusty, and uh, Bubba from Mama's Family, seasons three and forward. Uh, great movie. It's, it's, it's a lot of fun. 
Um, it's kind of like a, it is very Fright Night-ish. It's very like on the nose kind of humor. It, it's it's making fun of the 50s horror tropes. And it's, it's just a lot of fun. Really great watch. Uh, this awesome. morning, I watched the 1990s Wes Craven film, The People Under the Stairs, uh, which again is kind of like a, Okay. Kind of like a horror comedy again. Uh, this is like the third horror comedies I watched this year, this this week actually. Okay. Um, it's kind of weird. It's definitely not for everyone. It's a lot of over the top acting. Uh, the story is 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 pretty good. It's about a, a black family who's about to get evicted, and their landlords are these creepy white people, and you and <laughs> you descend into their madness as. There is treasure under the white people's house. <laughs> right. Old, and then old racist treasure. Uh, it's oh, it's something, Greg. <laughs> I, I will say I don't want to I don't want to ruin the reveal or the twist at the end because it's it, it definitely makes you go like, oh, my God. Um, but it is it is definitely not a movie for everyone. It, you yeah. have to you have to be in the mood for those kind of like. Kind of weird horror comedies yeah i feel like horror comedy in general is kind of a a, a very niche subgenre. not a lot of people like i mean it's it's kind of there's a lot of the same emotions that go into it where like it's kind of like a like surprise and timing is a big part of why it's effective i mean, I, yeah. I, I, I like horror comedies a lot i feel like um tucker and dale versus evil Yes, it's like probably like the cream of the crop in terms of recent ones, but yeah, I definitely love it or hate it. I can is as a genre for sure. And I watched the original Mummy from the nineteen forties. Oh, uh, going way back. Definitely, yeah, definitely not my favorite. Jackie's never seen that one. Surprisingly, um, it it has a lot of things going for it, but like a lot of movies of yesteryear. It's kind of like they look at their watch and they went, fuck, the movie needs to end. And here's the credits. Just uh, end it. Oh, mommy's dead. Yeah. Credits. <laughs> pretty much. It, it pretty much ends like, oh, hey, the mummy, you like you, you should die now. And he's like, oh, OK. <laughs> we hit that. I don't know. Was that like a 90 minute movie? Was that a thing for feature? Yeah. Fans then? Yeah. So pretty much we hit the 90 minute mark. Die and done. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm embarrassed to say a lot of those kind of universal monster, you know, monster classics. I, I have not seen a lot of them either. One of, one of these it's, days I'll go back and kind of revisit them. I think for me, it's pure nostalgia, um, pure moods. Uh, yeah. sail away sail away sail away uh, it's just like one of those things where like you know little phil was getting into horror and i watched all the classics and it just hit me at the time where i was like this is acceptable and enjoyable but i think like if you're not in that mood if you like miss the mark you know you you skip off into space right and you play with your phone for an hour and a half <laughs> exactly exactly um, if there's one classic movie that I will recommend is the original Invisible Man from a pure uh, special effects standpoint, it is still amazing oh, yeah. and groundbreaking for the time. I think that the movie overall is fun. It's not scary. I don't know why it gets classified as a horror movie. I actually laugh a lot in it and maybe I'm an asshole. I don't know, but I have a real <laughs> fun time watching it. Oh, yeah. Well, there it is, folks. Go see the Invisible Man. If you can, yeah. You know, if you're one of these people who doesn't like black and white movies, uh, watch it anyway. Yeah, or or if you don't like the black and white movie, just watch the 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 new remake because that movie is stellar. Oh yeah, hundred <laughs> percent agree with that one. Good old Blumhouse, you really uh, knocking out of the park lately with your with your reboots and reimaginings, aren't you? He's just putting in all that meat and he's making delicious sausage. <laughs> delicious, profitable sausage. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Well, I think overall, I mean, I can I can recommend Halloween Kills as a another piece of delicious movie sausage. So, if you're I, if you're a fan of the genre, definitely check it out. At least that's exactly. What I um, I'll recommend it to ten dollars on Peacock. You really can't go wrong. You can entertain everyone in your family, just not the little ones. No, yeah, stay. Yeah, this is. I mean, I don't know if we hit it hard home hard enough, but this is way more brutal. The kills are than Halloween 2018. Oh yeah. Wait, wait, exactly. So not a, it's a hard R that's for sure. R. Well, R. if you like what you're hearing, go ahead, like, subscribe, comment down below, leave us a review. 
email us at that's canon at gmail.com. Uh, ask us questions. Give us some constructive criticism. What can we do to make this podcast more enjoyable to you? Uh, I think I'm going to try to record the audio for this for the quote of the week for Greg. So you'll hear it, you know, in the podcast. I haven't forgotten it. Um, Woo. Yeah. Uh, have a happy, safe, spooky Halloween. Woo. We'll be back with more canon schlock. And I know Christmas is coming up. So we're going to try to figure out what the holiday movie is for that one. And Greg, I'm going to float the idea that we need to try to figure out a Thanksgiving one. I was just going to say, we, we can't be one of those people who skips over our, our good buddy Thanksgiving as the intermediate yeah. holiday. I think there's a, we'll find, we'll find something. We'll find something <laughs> uh, Turkey or Thanksgiving adjacent to watch. <laughs> Turkey related. I love it. <laughs> All right. Well, remember, since we said it. That's canon. <laughs>